Perfect. We are now live. Good morning, everybody. Um, I can confirm that we are now live, and I will call the meeting to order at exactly 9 a.m. Once again, on time. How about that, Councillor Stone? Um, with that, um, I would like to ask Councillor Clark if you wouldn't mind reading the land acknowledgement. Please. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg under the terms of the Robinson Huron Treaty No. 61 of 1850 and the Williams Treaties of 1923. We commit to acknowledge, learn, educate, create opportunity, honour sacred places and take actions toward real truth and reconciliation in support of our commitment to walking the path together in respect, peace and harmony for future generations. Thank you for that. Okay, moving right along. Um, I have a motion moved by uh, Dion Schumacher, seconded by Jason Fitzgerald. It is recommended that the General Committee meeting agenda dated Wednesday, March 29, 2023, be adopted as printed and circulated with the deletion of five under deputations, uh, the deputation from Sheena Red Repath, Muskoka Highlands Academy, as well as under new business, 10.2, the Muskoka Highlands Academy. Questions or comments? All those in favor? And that carries, thank you. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we'll move along to our invited and ceremonial presentations. And the first one is um, 4.1, Lakeland Holding Limited, a general overview uh, from Chris Lichko and is Vince here or just Chris? Just, okay. Welcome, Chris. Over to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So what I'd like to do is um, provide a little bit of an orientation on Lakeland. This is a company you own. Um, I know some of the counselors are new. Denise has probably been the longest uh, uh, term uh, representing the co um, your uh, municipality. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. And, and Denise obviously knows our, our uh, history also. So let's right, get right into it. It's a long presentation, but I'm not going to do it all. I know we, we're under a time constraint. So there we go. So there is uh, our, uh, our company that you own. Uh, we have uh, uh, different companies. We have a generation company. The networks company is basically our internet company. Our solutions company is our innovation company. And Lakeland Power is our distribution company. They distribute electricity uh, throughout uh, uh, the main core of Huntsville. So you are a shareholder of the entire Lakeland uh, Consolidated Company. <coughs> and these uh, shares, uh, I'll, I'll go back a little bit in history. How the company came about was under the Electricity Act back in 2000. Mike Harris government, uh, there was 330 hydroelectric commissions. Like Magnetowan had a commission. Every municipality basically had a commission. The Mike Harris government thought, you know, there was just uh, too much fad in the system. They wanted to... Uh, decrease the amount of distribution companies and, and create competition. So he made us incorporate our companies and become for profit back in 2000. So before that, what we did is uh, the municipalities of uh, Bracebridge, uh, Perry Sound, Sundridge, Berks Falls, and uh, Magnetowan, we all got together and thought, if we're going to do this, why don't we combine and merge together? Perry Sound came on later, and th those are how the shares came out. The shares basically came out on the net book value of the assets at the time. As you can see, Bracebridge has the majority, and basically they had the majority hydro customers, but they also had three hydroelectric plants too, so they brought a lot of assets in at the time. So right now, uh, we have paid approximately uh, $21 million in uh, dividends since about 2005 to our shareholders. We're paying approximately $424,000 now to Huntsville. We have a $2 million dividend annually right now that we're paying to our shareholders. Uh, we do have an extensive shareholder agreement uh, that we abide by, the board of directors abide by. And for the most part, the board of directors uh, can make decisions up to about $5 million, any acquisitions and any other business interests. Other, uh, uh, 
once it uh, surpasses $5 million, we will call a special shareholder meeting. The shareholders are represented by the mayor's, his or her uh, designate. And so for the last uh, uh, meeting, we had uh, uh, Mayor Alcock at the, at the meeting, representing uh, the interests of uh, Huntsville. So our mission uh, on the entire company is really about sustainable growth and our team. Um, we have an incredible team. Um, we're lucky for where we live uh, to be able to get the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the type of people we have, especially in the IT side. It's hard to get those types of people, but uh, we've been blessed to uh, be able to get those people, and a lot of them do live here already. So it was, it's been a great team to, to work with. Uh, just like Huntsville, we rebranded our company uh, in 2002. Most companies have mission, vision, and goals. Uh, after rebranding, we did an extensive interview process with all of our, our, um, uh, our staff, and some of the things that came out, we thought instead of mission, vision, goals, we'll have values instead. And you can see the values there. I won't go through them all. Um, they're quite extensive. But also on the pillar side, obviously we're all about community. Uh, possibility next first we're trying to be very innovative very proactive as much as possible and together uh, we work together uh, both with our shareholders and uh, our, obviously we have an incredible team that I can't speak highly enough about so the board of directors uh, one of the successes I think that we've had compared to a lot of uh, other uh, distribution companies and, and people that merged back in 2000, Mike Harris's, uh, the shareholders decided to uh, elect an independent board of directors. Uh, our board of directors are all independent, non-political, and they're all very highly uh, skilled and f uh, highly uh, successful uh, business people throughout uh, Ontario. So these are your board of directors um, uh, um, throughout uh, the uh, generation, the holding, and the networks company. And then in the Lakeland Power, we have similar. Uh, why we have independent beside the chair and uh, the director, Kara, is the entire energy board, because it's so highly regulated, they want uh, two independent people from outside that are not on the other boards, just to make sure there's no commingling and make sure the ratepayers' money is being used wisely just in Lakeland Power. This one I thought, make sure you don't put pictures in, because you we just ruined the presentation. <laughs> so uh, just so, since about 2006, we've made quite a few investments and in acquisitions, about $60 million uh, to grow the company. And these are just uh, some of those uh, acquisitions. And again, right if you look at 2015, Perry Sound, we did approach them back in 2000 to merge with us. They stayed on their own and then 2015, 14, they approached us and they merged back in with us and thought it was a uh, good idea. It was hard for them to be on their own. So um, Lakeland Power is your distribution company. And for the most part, we distribute electricity just in the urban core of uh, Huntsville. Uh, Hydro One does the uh, rural area. And so really it's all about safety, customer service, and reliability. Um, you may or may not know this, but your electricity comes from Utterson. There's a transformer station there, and that's where you receive your electricity in Huntsville. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're proud of done about uh, 18, 15 years ago is the urban core of Huntsville was being fed from a feeder from Hydro One. And it was uh, basically, it was a long feeder that left Mus uh, Utterson, came to Huntsville, and went all the way up to uh, Sundridge. So anywhere on that feeder, if there was a problem, Huntsville was going out. At the same time, we noticed they had a short feeder just going to Huntsville that they weren't using. They were just using for industrial customer. So we were able to convince Hydro One at the time, uh, about 18, 15 years ago, to put all of uh, our, the urban core of Huntsville on that shorter feeder, and it's improved your uh, um, reliability considerably since then. So it's been a big win for us and, uh, and for Huntsville. Uh, just some st statistics uh, on the uh, on the uh, distribution company. Now, our networks company is basically our uh, internet, our fiber company. It's our triple play company. We we offer uh, TV, internet, and uh, phone. And we're really what we're offering here is some big city offerings, and uh, we've been quite successful. We started this company in about 2008, not really knowing what we're doing. And we were able to get some incredible staff on site, and uh, we've got more than 600 kilometers of fiber and 8,000 customers. 
and that is our, our goal is to be the, the triple play uh, premier triple uh, play service provider for residential and business customers throughout the, our expanding area and we offer other uh, uh, um, products and services too but our main focus is the fiber optic uh, network that we continue to expand uh, we have a little bit of wireless going on also and we do street light maintenance and those sorts of things too because of our highly skilled staff we, we're able to do other IT things uh, such as IT server hosting and uh, business phones and those sorts of things too. In the generation company we have nine water power generation plants uh, across uh, the watershed from Perry Sound all the way to uh, uh, Bancroft and we've purchased we started with three uh, generation plants and now we have nine and uh, our mission obviously is uh, to operate environmentally friendly generation assets safely efficiently efficiently while continuing to grow this portfolio as we are today so these are the diff different plants that we have and the sizes that we have and they're all green power um, they're run of the river we don't store water just whatever river uh, water is in the river at the time is what we know uh, what the uh, future was for electricity generation in Ontario with the Green Energy Act and all the different uh, changes occurring. So we thought there is a lot of water power. Uh, basically all of Quebec is water power uh, generated electricity and th we thought we'd get a, a, a foot into that uh, province also and then we'll see where that takes us. So we do have a small plant that we have 50% uh, ownership over in Quebec. And I'll talk about the solar and the Tesla uh, coming up. So here's uh, Energy Solutions. The Solutions Company is really just a, a, um, a division of the generation company, and this is where we do a lot of our innovation. Um, so what we have done is we've put together a speed year in democracy. Um, and in, Co in uh, Perry Sound, uh, we put a 500 kilowatt solar field in. We connected it to a 1.2 megawatt battery, storage battery. And with that electricity, we're able to uh, uh, feed Lakeland Power customers and also feed the wastewater treatment plant um, because we put it on an old dump um, site in um, which was Brownfield. You really couldn't do anything with in Perry Sound and we're able to feed the wastewater treatment plant also. The interesting part about this innovation pr uh, project is about 11 million dollars. We got a lot of NR CAN funding is uh, the electricity can be produced uh, from the uh, solar into the battery and one of the things that has done, uh, we've had four outages in Perry Sound the last two years, uh, the last two years, and this has kept one feeder on, a section of town on, seamlessly, and it's never been done before in Canada. The lights didn't even flicker when the power went out, uh, so it was uh, something that we're trying to expand. Uh, we're looking for other partners, and uh, um, we're also been asked to consult on other projects. So that's uh, this is uh, innovation side of the house that we're trying to uh, grow uh, along with the other uh, parts of the company. EV chargers, I know that um, you've supported some EV chargers and we continue to work with uh, the town. I think uh, Vince might be coming in the next month also to talk to you about, our chief operating officer to talk about uh, some EV chargers. And I think it's your environmental committee you've been invited to. So um, we're also, this is where we're also doing the EV charger rollout and we're putting EV chargers in every municipality, all of our shareholder municipalities. So Quickly, we do have an annual shareholder meeting. Uh, the shareholder agreement, as I stated, if, if there's something that comes up, we'll, we can call a special shareholder meeting. But every uh, uh, first Friday in June, we have an annual shareholder meeting. And this is just basically the, the agenda that happens uh, uh, every annual meeting. You know, we go through the, uh, the review the past year um, highlights. And then we also uh, present on a high level the business plans, the board structures, and then the dividend going forward that uh, we're suggesting or that the board has uh, approved going forward. So really quickly, um, we have a generation company, the power company, and the networks company. Uh, I think I said there was about 320, 330 hydroelectric commissions back in 2000. Now there's 60 hi uh, hydro distribution companies and we're one of them. Uh, we have about $156 million in assets, about $72 million in annual revenue. And when we started this company, we had 18 to 20 staff, so we're up to 100 staff now, and uh, we're very, very innovative. And 
Um, we continue to try to be innovative. We don't want to fall behind, but we want to be on the cusp of uh, leading edge, uh, especially electricity. And I think even the federal gov uh, budget last night, you'll see there was a lot of uh, talk and a lot of funding coming up for some green energy initiatives. So we want to be on, uh, on the cusp of those sorts of things. So um, uh, Denise and Mayor, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I always find your presentation really, really interesting. Um, and I'm sure there'd be a number of questions. Any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Stone. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Chris. Um, two quick questions. So are you still laying fiber networks, fiber internet in the rural areas? Yes, absolutely, yes. Excellent. Um, keep going. <laughs> um, and the other question is, we once looked at Green Bug Energy putting in a, um, it, was, it was a screw, it was a green type of energy at our, uh, the dam at, at, at our locks. Is that an opportunity for us or not? That's an Archimedes, Archimedes screw or something mm -hmm. back, way back when. Um, the, the, the problem is uh, generation, and, and we took advantage of it was the Green Energy Act. We were able, they were able to give us uh, there's no funding available anymore and there's no guaranteed contracts. We were able to get 40 year guaranteed contracts so you could work your way back seeing what, what the uh, uh, revenues were going to be to pay for those capital costs. There's no more programs like that right now. So it, it, it is an opportunity, but I don't see it happening anytime soon unless some kind of program comes out that makes it financially viable. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris, you mentioned the, the great success of the solar field in Perry Sound, and given yesterday's budget, federal budget, it would seem to me that um, there will be tremendous opportunity. And I, I know you said you are looking at other opportunities. Is that something, will there be a heavy focus in that? Absolutely. We're looking at every opportunity we can to grow the company, and we really uh, have uh, had a lot of success in the green energy, on the green side, whether it's solar, whether it's water power, and we continue to always look at those opportunities. Okay, that's great. Are there any other? Yes, Councillor Morrison. Thank you, Mayor Alcock, and through you, um, thank you for the presentation. I do know that when I was in real estate with my friend Corey over here, I've had some clients that would specifically look uh, to buy homes within the Lakeland District because the service levels that you guys provide are, are phenomenal. Question, we had a, a chat recently about adding a generator to uh, here at the town, at the town, town building. We're, uh, some of the considerations were the size of the generator, the noise of the generator. You brought up what you're doing in Perry Sound, the innovation over there and keeping the lights on and, and, and during uh, hydro outages. Do you know, is there a solution that you can think of or something that you're working on that could help us right here in our core so that maybe we wouldn't need a big generator? Or we could certainly talk about that. I'll, I'll talk to Vince, he's uh, kind of our technical guru, our chief operating officer, he's the one with all of the uh, ideas, but it's something we can talk about. I think he will be here next uh, month, I believe, too. He'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. That's a, a great question, and we will follow up at the Environment Committee with that, that sp um, specific question. Really good. So we, and you're right, he, he is, uh, presenting at the Environment Good. Committee in April. So certainly we'll make note of that. Great question. And I uh, totally agree. I'm really fortunate to live in a rural area that has the fiber optic cable and it's fantastic. And it is a real feature in our community. I think we were one of the first. So um, thank, you. thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Chris, thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation and have a great day. So our sec our, um, we're moving along to our deputation section, and our first deputation is uh, 5.1, Community Living Huntsville, uh, request on wa waiving of fees, and Jennifer Jarrett is joining us. Welcome, Jennifer. Good morning, Mayor Elcock and Deputy Mayor Ke uh, Armour and Council. Um, as you mentioned, I am Jennifer Jarrett. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist at Community Living in Huntsville. And I am here today to respectfully request that you uh, waive the Algonquin Theatre fees for our Huntsville's Got Talent event that happened on, May, on March 4th. Um, we would like to redirect those funds towards our transitional housing 
and housing related initiatives for people with developmental disabilities in our community. As we all know, the cost of living has um, been steadily rising over the years, dramatically affecting access to housing and the ability to pay for it. People with developmental disabilities are often among the most vulnerable when it comes to housing insecurity, and we must do everything we can to ensure that community members with developmental disabilities have equitable access to safe, affordable, sustainable housing options. This is why every penny counts. We've been working tirelessly to provide housing and support for people with developmental disabilities in new and innovative ways. The Towns Theatre is an important venue for us to hold events um, and fundraisers. However, the fees are cutting into the important revenue that would otherwise be helping people with developmental disabilities keep a roof over their heads. Why is that important? You can't build, a, you can't build your life if you don't know where you're going to sleep at night. Just think about that. You cannot build your life if you do not know where you're going to sleep at night. Having somewhere safe and stable to call your own can make all the difference. And I'll give you an example. A young man with a developmental disability and mental illness was homeless. That meant living on the street, emergency shelter in motels, and eventually that led to the hospital. Community Living built a team around him, developed a support plan, and helped him find an apartment. Before he moved into his apartment, one of our staff noticed something. The young man never took off his shoes, never. He went to bed in his shoes, he woke up in his shoes. He refused to take them off, ever. Why? They made him feel safe. With his shoes on, he was ready to run away from danger. He was ready to run for help. Life had taught him to wear his shoes. Life had taught him he was never really safe. When staff helped him move into his apartment, they helped him set up his room, organize his cupboards, make the space his own. He had his own bed, his own closet, his own fridge. At the end of, it was a really great day. At the end of that day, he bent over and he untied his laces and he took off his shoes. He said goodnight, went into his bedroom and closed the door behind him. That's what it means to have a home. Safety, security, empowerment and dignity. Waiving the theater rental fees will benefit the whole community. When we invest in housing initiatives, we are investing in the future of our community. And there is something, and that is something that we should all be proud to support. In addition, by supporting Community Living Huntsville, you are also sending a message that you support diversity, inclusivity in our community. People with developmental disabilities deserve to have the same opportunities as everyone else and providing them with the support they need, we are helping to create a more just and equitable society. In conclusion, I urge you to waive the fees for the community living Huntsville's use of the town's theater. This is a small but important step that we can take to support our transitional housing and housing related initiatives that assist people with developmental disabilities. By doing so, we can help to create a more inclusive and equitable community that we can all be proud to call home. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you for the presentation, Jennifer. Um, are there any questions uh, at this point? Yes, Councillor Renwick. Thank you, Chair, um, Mayor Alcock, thank you. Um, Jennifer, a question and then I have a comment, but the question is how much money did the uh, Huntsville Got Talent make? The overall event made over 17,000. Okay, $17,000. That includes all of the sponsorship that was brought in. Right, okay. Yes. So that, that would be my question, and if I may, uh, my comment is um, I want to congratulate uh, Community Living on the absolutely fabulous show uh, and the raising of the money that, um, you know, for such an excellent cause, and you did a, you know, an incredible job doing that. Um, I personally supported the event um, by donating my time and my efforts uh, to being the MC for the day. I completely enjoyed it. Um, there were three local judges who also support gave up their time, they volunteered their time, um, as well as the 10 participants that also took part in it, they all donated their time. Um, so 
for those reasons, well, not for, for those reasons, but I, I can't support this motion uh, to waive the fees. Um, there was a contract that was signed with the theater, um, and it, it was a very successful show, and I think that contract should be honored. Um, the, I spoke to the, uh, the people that actually created the Huntsville's Got Talent, so um, the Markhams, and in, in the three previous years, there was no asking of waiving of fees for this show. Um, they paid, and, and I think the, the cost was very similar for, from 2019 to what you're paying now, um, but they did not ask for a waiving of fees. And I'm just, I'm just concerned that, and I'm, I'm talking off topic a little bit, but the Huntsville Festival of the Arts has an incredible show in right now, and they, they're not asking for a waiving of fees. Um, they're also a not-for-profit organization, so it's a bit of a slippery slope if we start giving, giving back money. We want the theater to thrive, and we want, um, we want to have events there, and you were given a, um, a residence or a, uh, a discount with the, 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 pay, the rate. It wasn't the commercial rate, it was the, the residential rate or the, the, the community rate. Thank you. Yeah. So I can't support this motion the way it is. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Renwick. I should, I should have said, Jennifer, that what you know the routine, that at later in the meeting we will be dealing with this, yes. this motion. At, I think it's item 10.1 or something like that. Am, am I able to respond? Yes, of okay. course you are. Yes, <laughs> thank of you. Of course you are. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I fully understand and, and can see where you're coming from completely. Thank you. Um, I think... I think for us, the difference between the Markhams and community living is that when the Markhams ran it, they were an independent business. They were not, they were not a not-for-profit. And any of those funds that um, were on the invoice, they paid out of their own pocket. They, uh, they covered those fees. And, and so all that money came back to community living as the recipient of that event. So uh, it's a little different now because we are the ones putting on the event. Um, we are the ones that, um, so that money would have obviously been coming out of our pocket. I think what, I think originally what um, sort of threw me, yes, we did sign a contract, um, but as an example, we did an event eight months ago and the theater rental fee went from 200 to over $800. So that really, um, that really surprised me. Okay, and I think Councillor Renwick wants to respond to that. Mm. Respond to yeah, that. Yeah. So, I, and I think it was um, they're totally different events. One was a speaker series, and this is a, a full-fledged theater technician yeah. rehearsal space. Um, mm -hmm. There are different rates for different shows, so that's that's the difference in the cost of the. Um, you know, the, the, that's why the, ch the charge went for two hundred to eight hundred. Right. I see. I show. see the addition of the of the uh, labor and the extra manpower. Yeah. In yes. a separate line, I see that. Mm -hmm. So I just was, I was concerned about that. Yep. Um, I know that um, wh what you had said about the festival and being a not-for-profit, um, I see that it is definitely a slippery slope. Um, but what I would uh, ask the council to consider is really having a not-for-profit rate for registered charities with a, with a registered charity number. Um, I think that would help alleviate a lot of what comes to council and what doesn't need to come to council. Um, and it, like I said, these monies are putting roofs over people's heads. This is, this is, this is life, and, life and death, really, at the end of the day for somebody living on the streets in the middle of winter in Muskoka with a mental illness or a developmental disability. So I, I, I really appreciate those comments um, and congratulations, by the way, on the recent success of, Thank an, you. of another grant for exactly that purpose. Thank you. So, which is awesome. I would like to ask Julia if you wouldn't mind speaking to, um, we don't have any not-for-profit rates. I thought we did, or maybe, or Simone, maybe I could, okay. Um, and I think there was a hand over here while Simone is looking that <laughs> up because you raise a, an excellent point. Um, Deputy Mayor Armour. Uh, thank you, Chair Alcock. Um, as I respect um, Councillor Renwick and her comments, I, th I feel this is, um, the town of Huntsville is not able to give donations to charitable organizations. But one thing we can do as a town is waive fees, minus the cost actually, right? So our cost for the employees, et cetera, lighting, et cetera. 
but I think this is an opportunity for us to give back to our community, and it doesn't affect any taxpayers. So it's, um, I think it's a win-win for everybody, and as you say, it puts roof overhead. So I think it's important, and I'll, I'll be supporting it. Okay, thank you for that. And Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Worship, and thanks, Jennifer, for coming. Um, I wasn't able to attend this year. I was out of town, but um, I do try and support it. How many clients do you serve in the Huntsville area? We serve over 300 people 300. with developmental disabilities and their families. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Good job on Thank you. this year. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morrison. Thank you, Mayor Alcock, and through you, I, I think I'm kind of in between where Dan and, or where Councillor Armour and Councillor Renwick are. I, I love what Community Living has done. I know so many people that have given their time and, and work there, and, and it fits in with our, our focus on community wellness, our focus on housing, addiction, mental health. Um, but the only trouble I have is like it's, a, it's an ask after the fact. And, uh, but what I love is that you brought to the table the fact that maybe we do need to look at uh, rates. I held a, a fundraising, uh, before my time on council, I held a fundraiser at the theater. And, and I will say I was a bit surprised at the, the, the extra layers of fees. They just kept adding up and adding up and the ticketing fees and whatnot. So we ended up losing money and we were raising money for the Rainbow Railroad at the time. Um, so we ended up being out of pocket to, to donate the money we wanted. So I did, it is, it is expensive to put a show on at our theater for sure. Your show was successful, thankfully, it went more than mine. Um, uh, so I, I think I could probably support somewhere in, in between. Maybe um, if we could maybe give back half of the fees. Um, and in the future, maybe it'd be a conversation beforehand because maybe there's some HMATA funding, maybe there's some other funding that we can do to help you with your fundraising efforts. Completely, and thank you for that. I mm. didn't know that I could do this. <laughs> 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 or you would have seen me way before mm. our event. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I didn't yeah. know you could actually come and uh, present a deputation and, and request that. Yeah. So this is a fabulous opportunity. Thank you. No I think this is turning out to be an excellent conversation. I, I had a, a little note here about possibility of HMATA funds or partial waiving or, or having a discussion around what our, our fees look like. And I, I, I apologize, Councillor Schumacher, but I think Simone or Julia are ready to respond on the question around our fees. Um, so we do have um, three different rates. We have the commercial rate, um, and then we also have a resident rate, which is also um, includes residents or nonprofit organizations are, pass, are not passed on to their members, so that was the rate that they were charged. Our subsidized rate refers to schools or volunteer organizations targeting youth only. So that's, that's where we so, were not able to charge so that rate. So maybe there, I think there's some appetite to look at that third definition and perhaps um, expand that that would be a little more inclusive of other interests. I don't know, I, it's a possibility. Mm. It, it seems like there's some, and Councillor Schumacher. Well, yes, so, so now to add to that point, transitional aged youth is, I mean, yes, it, it bridges the definition of adult past 18, but still within the developmental sector, we tend to go to that till like 21, 25, that kind of thing. So I, I do think we, we definitely could look at that. Um, again, to Councillor Armour's point, we can't donate, so I do like the idea of the fees being reduced. Maybe it isn't the full amount, maybe it is, you know, a, as we said. It's us as a council, I think we need to decide because there is an expectation for some sort of revenue, so as long as we're okay with putting that on the books to say, okay, we didn't meet our revenue targets because we gave away this amount of money to that effect, then I think we as a council swallow that and we appreciate what it is that you bring as an opportunity to showcase community. And I think you did an excellent job, I did attend and I did participate by you dancing. You did participate. <laughs> <laughs> you did indeed. <laughs> Councillor Stone, thank you. Thank you. you. Um, thanks for your presentation. Love what you do. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm on the fence about this as well. Um, first of all, uh, coming after the fact is, is problematic. Um, so, uh, was that your point too? No. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, uh, we uh, do, uh, send asks like this to HMATA these days because uh, they do have a pot of money to to help draw people and do activities in town. Um, so can you tell me how much 
were th are the fees that you're asking to be relieved? Uh, what, what's the number? It was three fifty-five. Three thousand five hundred. Yes. Three thousand fifty-five. All right, that's uh, not insignificant. Um, the the one point I I'd like to make is is our theater is already underfunded, and we um, the taxpayer picks up the tab to keep this this amazing building that is used for the community for sure. Um, if we relieve the fees, are we asking the taxpayer again to um, pay double? Um, is it double dipping? I don't know. Um, but you do great work, want to support you, Thank you. Um, so I'm on the fence. I, I don't know how I will vote. I th Look you at that, Jennifer. Look at <laughs> <laughs> that follows me wherever I go. <laughs> I kind of expected that. <laughs> um, what, what I would like to say is that um, this specific program for housing and our housing initiatives is not ministry funded. So it is our taxpayers that are, are carrying us. It is our taxpayers and businesses in our community that are putting roofs over, the, of, over people's heads. So, um, so I, again, I come to the council and the town to join them in that. Okay. And, uh, oh, sorry, follow up. Just, just, a, just a quick comment is that the, the dis district um, is charged with taking care of homelessness uh, mm -hmm. in all of Muskoka and mm -hmm. do a wonderful job in coordination with you as well. So mm -hmm. yes. I, I know that, that we are funding that yes. work that the district does. Definitely. Indeed. Um, Councilor Schumacher. So yes, the ask. So I guess that is my question too, is how well do we promote the fact that you should have come ahead of time? Also, I am aware, I think there's community grants you can apply for as mm -hmm. well as the HMATA. There's different avenues. Were you aware of these prior to? I was not aware that I could come and do this. Okay. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> it was a it was a conversation I had had with a counselor, and they brought it to my attention that this could be done, and hence I am sitting here. So um, had I known in advance, I certainly would have come and, and done that for sure. Um, I apologize; it is after the fact and does put a bit of a, a sticky situation in your laps. But um, you were. Well, all rise to the occasion, I'm sure. Um, so definitely. And as far as grants, we do apply for grants. We, we wholeheartedly ap apply for grants. Um, our transitional housing um, initiative, we need to grow. We, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we've got um, people that we support that are being evicted and can't afford apartments in, in, our, in their community. So um, our, that, and, and not only individuals, but whole families that are, are facing this, this devastation. So, um, you know, it's, it's a program that we foresee will need funding and that we will be fundraising for for the next unforeseeable future. No, it's amazing, actually, the work that Community Living has been doing um, and expanding their horizons with respect to um, housing and uh, all of that. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with it, actually. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to Councillor Clark first and then followed by Deputy Mayor Armour. Thank you, Mayor Alcock, and um, thank you for the work you, that you do in the community. Um, as Councillor Morris, Morrison said, I'm, uh, I'd be somewhere in the middle as well <laughs> on this, I oh. think. Um, Councillor Stone and Renwick both had good points, I thought, as well. I think in this case, a good compromise for me would be a partial uh, waiving of the fees. So that's, I think, where I would sit on it personally. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Deputy Mayor Armour. Uh, thank you, Chair Alcock. Just a quick comment. I'm the councillor that met with Jeanette, and she wasn't aware that she could actually come here and ask for waiving of the fees, so I'm the one that suggested mm -hmm. she come here and give us a deputation, and, and I think we'll all do right by them. Thanks. Okay, I think we've had one healthy conversation. <laughs> and as I said, we are in fact revisiting this conversation near the Correct. end of the meeting. And someone will let you know. Thank you so much. Right? Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, um, and next up we have 
Um, Dan Watson, uh, Public Art Projects Again, Waiving of Fees, and Dan Watson from HFA. Welcome, Dan. Turn that one on. I'll just use both. I don't know. <laughs> just use one. Dan, you need to, you need two mics. No, Is no, that no, that's how yes. you roll? Yes, or? That's that. It's in my rider. <laughs> it's in my rider. There we go. Two mics. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to thank you very much for for making the time for me to come here. Um, I'm representing the Huntsville Festival of the Arts, and I think you most of you are very familiar with the work that we do. We're here today to talk about two public art initiatives that we've been doing over the past number of years. Um, one is the uh, Play May I'm Yours. It's a, a piano that we place in front of the Algonquin Theater uh, every year and it's uh, free to use and people um, take, take time and they do use it a lot. Uh, and then we all have, over the past few years, actually since COVID started, we start, we've been doing the um, Group of Seven or Tom Thompson canoe murals. So we display uh, canoes in the park that have been painted by local artists, uh, celebrating the work of either uh, Tom Thompson or uh, Group of Seven. Um, the canoes are displayed in the park, in Rivermill Park, throughout the summer. Um, on sawhorses and, uh, and are easily transportable. So there's, um, what we're here today to ask is uh, one permission and to th for a waiving of fees uh, uh, on these two initiatives. Um, in particular, I, th I guess I'm not even sure if there is a, a, a fee schedule for in front of uh, the theater. Uh, and, uh, and, and in terms of River Mill Park, it's not a, um, just to be clear, it's not a, an exclusive use of the park. Uh, we, we work with town staff, so if there's an event that's gonna happen, uh, me and my team, we go down and we move the canoes and then we move them back the next day. So uh, that's not a problem um, in terms of in, uh, asking for exclusive use of the park. Uh, I think they, they offer a lot of benefits just to, to local um, uh, visitation, something that is, you know, sets us apart as Huntsville as an, an interesting brand. Uh, it creates a, a great experience for people coming and, and it offers local community members also an outlet of um, creativity and to see, to not only see the art but actually get to play the piano in front of the, uh, in front of the theater. We have lots of people that, that don't have pianos that get to come and, and play. And uh, so uh, that's my, my pitch. We're hoping that, uh, you know, these, these happen throughout the summer. Um, so from about May until Thanksgiving. And, uh, and I believe the, the, it's been amended so that maybe we can save, hopefully there's support that we can just do this over a, a couple of years uh, since we've been doing it for, for many years so that we can save some time. And, and uh, I know you, I like coming in, in front of you guys, <laughs> but maybe you have other things to do as well, so. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, that's, I'm glad you spoke to that because I, I had understood that perhaps this might be multi-year so that you don't actually have to keep coming back because we do traditionally waive the fees mm -hmm. and it is such a great. I, quick question, are the canoes, aren't they sold at some point? And if, if so, when is that? Yeah, so what, well, we've actually only ever done it once and that okay. was through the Algonquin Outfitters Paddle Art uh, right. auction. Right. Um, so the first ones that Jerry Lantain made back in 2020, uh, were sold off through that, and that those benefit uh, the the amounts go to different arts organizations. That's that's done through the uh, Algonquin Outfitters. So we sort of just hand it over them. to them, and they okay. they run the auction and and divvy up the money. So, so presumably, they the ones from last year will be sold. Yeah, at we're some getting point. a good collection now too. So uh, okay. we've been we've well, been sort of taking them to I different. Not that I should be even interested. Yeah. I just was uh, curious. Some were up at actually a, the ones we made last year were up at Eclipse this summer. Um, we had them out at the uh, Algonquin Art Center. We're in talks actually with we, uh, Councillor Renwick and I met with uh, the Lake of Bays, uh, folks who are interested in having some out there as well. So they're starting to, um, get out there. All right, that's great. And I think Councillor Renwick, you had your hand up. Thank you, Your Worship, and, and thank you, Dan, for coming and, and speaking to us. I mean, I, I love to see you every year when you talk <laughs> about this, but I agree. I think because we've been do, you've been doing this for such a long time, um, the canoes and the piano, that 
in the MOU that we have with that you have with the town, and I think I, I did spoke speak to the director about this. That perhaps that that could just be in the memorandum of understanding that you wouldn't have to come to us every year to ask for this waiving of fees because it's something that has been going on. So you had mentioned that too, um, but I would be in support of this motion. Support it, sure. Yeah. Um, Councillor Clark, followed by Councillor Stoll. Thank you, Mayor Alcock. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the work that you do and. Uh, the piano and the canoes, I, I both like both of those. The, the piano especially. Um, I walk uptown every day, um, always to go to the bank to do a deposit. And I don't know how many times I walk past that piano and somebody's playing it. Usually more times than not. Sometimes it's uh, the talent on the display is surprisingly uh, you know, well done, other times not so much. <laughs> but either way, I think it's a it's a neat thing to have on Main Street. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Stone. Thanks. This is an easy one for me. You know, it's, it's passive use. It uh, creates some excitement for people, locals and tourists, uh, that it's happening. Uh, I play the piano myself. I, I'm one of those ones that don't play very well. Um, <laughs> can I ask that you make sure all the keys work? <laughs> I'd, I'd love to make that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to make that uh, guarantee. As as the summer goes on, they tend to, uh, you know, they tend. Some of them tend to go away. But we did actually have a piano tuner last year come and, and try to tune it up as best he could. Wow. But, yeah. That's that's quite remarkable. <laughs> All right, I think that's it, Dan. Thanks once again, Thank you. and you know the routine. We'll be dealing with this at the sure. end of the meeting. Thank okay. You. Thank you. And finally, I think our last uh, deputation is Melissa Pohl, uh, Three Fires International Film Festival. And, um, oh, online. Okay, I was wondering. I was looking up there and thinking, aha, okay, Melissa will be joining us online. Okay, we can see you, Melissa. Can you hear us? Hi, yes, I can. Um, so Welcome. I'm just trying to share my screen here. Okay. Let's see. Um, so thank you everyone for having me today. Uh, um, likewise, I wasn't sure of the whole process with this. This is my first time, so thank you.
is one example of you know what what's possible for a PhD. Um, it was definitely a, a bit of um, a journey um, getting this approved uh, from my department, but nonetheless, I'm the first ever um, uh, research creation project that's been approved by Boston University, so it's really exciting. Um, and what's more exciting is how engaging it will be within a community. Um, so part of our mission is um, to create and inspire change one story at a time, as well as empower youth through storytelling. And then so this is our logo in the bottom right corner, and so our three main mission, three main focuses are community, creativity, and culture. And so we've been working hard to partner with various organizations in the community. Um, I'd like to thank Dan and Huntsville Festival of the Arts for sponsoring us for the Bonta Theater, um, as well as we're partnering with Muskoka Pride. Um, we're working out things with YWCA, as well as the Bata Mohawks. Um, so the solution to these problems is through Fires International Film Festival. We also have a mobile production studio where we bring film production programming. Thirtieth in Rivermill Park for setting. For volunteers, sponsorships, and partners, as well as vendors in the foods and arts. And so that's my mini presentation on Three Fires International Film Festival, and thank you for having me today. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Really interesting presentation. Um, and I will open it up to uh, council because I, I expect there would be some questions or comments. Um, this is the, the first time, obviously, that you've um, done this in Huntsville, um, given your thesis, right? Yes. Interesting. Um, are there any questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Renwick, I knew you'd, you'd be all <laughs> over this. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and thank you, Melissa, for coming forward and uh, presenting this. It makes me very excited to see um, young women taking on this, in this initiative and um, you know, looking forward. We, we used to have a film festival in Huntsville uh, that was produced by Lucy Wing quite a while ago. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see that this is coming back. So you've got um, a festival that's happening in the summertime in the park, and you said, sorry, you said there was a large screen that you've got, um, like you're showing films in the park? Did yeah. I hear that? Yeah, okay. Yes, it's a, uh, so we're, we've uh, partnered with Muskoka Event Services as well, and so they're setting up a large tent, and then within that tent, um, it's gonna be a large screen with seating on the inside. Great, awesome, well, congratulations, that's wonderful. Melissa, you you um, the, you mentioned your team, I, and you've got the support from the Wata Mohawks. And I wonder, um, are any members of your team from the Wata community? Yes, Ariel Berwick. Um, so she's also part of the Wata Youth Council, uh, the Iroquois Confederacy of First Nations. Right. Yep. Uh, and um, so she's she's very active uh, within all the communities, and then so she's been kind of like heading that community engagement with. Indigenous peoples. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Councillor Schumacher. Thank you to you, Mayor Alcock. Um, yes, you bring up a very good point. I know myself growing up here in Muskoka, you tend to have to go away to school in order to then bring back your expertise to this area because there isn't a lot of opportunities for young people. So it is definitely something that 
I probably think we, we do need to continue to look at. I really love this initiative. I don't know if you can answer this or Dan who's sitting in our audience, but is it in correlation with Nuit Blanche that same weekend? No, it's not the same weekend as Nuit Blanche. Okay, so awesome. Something else to add to our agenda on the town of Huntsville. So I look forward to that. I know since we lost our theater in Huntsville, we have been doing some of the Real Alternatives movies in there I've attended. It's a great venue to actually see a movie as well. So definitely something to, to look forward to. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Worship, and uh, thanks for your, your presentation. I just have a question. I wonder where you are in the process of, of dealing with town staff regarding some of your applications and permits and things that are required, because you probably should get that ball rolling. Yeah, that's, that's been rolling. Um, so I've submitted the seat application and we're meeting with the BIA, I believe next week, uh, to talk to all the local businesses about it. So yeah, that's definitely rolling. Great, um, it's good to hear. And I'm, I'm on your website trying to look up information about who's gonna be here and what we can see. So I know you've got to, to confirm some things and update it, but I'm, I'm excited that you're trying to make this happen. So good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, I don't see any other questions. It looks like you've got some excellent sponsors already, which is fantastic with the help of HFA and Wata Mohawks and others. So that's, that's fantastic. I also look forward to it. Thank you for presenting uh, to us today. Thank really you for great. having me. Okay, thank you. Uh, did I miss anybody before I, okay. All right. Moving right along. Okay, so I have a motion moved by Bob Stone, seconded by Helena Renwick. It is recommended that the next portion of the meeting be closed to the public, commencing now at 9.57 a.m. for the purpose of considering the following matters under the Municipal Act 2001. 6.1, Section 239, 3.1, the meeting to be held for education or training purposes. 6.1.1, Tarmo Yukivi, Director of Operations and Protective Services, and Gary Monahan, Fire Chief, Re-Emergency Management. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you.
How about a 10 minute break, everybody? So it is 11.07, so 11.17-ish. Okay, thank you.
Okay, welcome back everybody. So we're going to start the remaining part of our general committee meeting. And I, starting with a motion moved by Dion Schumacher, seconded by Jason Fitzgerald, it is recommended that the joint meeting minutes of the Active Transportation and Public Transit Committee, Community Service Master Plan and Waterfront Strategy Committee, Environment and Climate Change Committee, dated March 21st, 2023, be adopted as printed and circulated. And I will ask uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, since you chaired that meeting, if you'd like to make a couple of comments. I would. A, it um, was a great meeting. I, I was pleased that almost every member made it out, and, and uh, Trevor did an amazing job of organizing us all. Trevor just left, so he doesn't get the accolades, but um, feel free to reach out to him if you have any questions. He's very helpful, uh, very thorough, and uh, the only thing I, I neglected to do at the whole meeting was introduce Deputy Mayor Armour, but it wasn't on the agenda, so. Um, yeah, so, but it, it was, I'm, I'm pleased. People were a little unimpressed by how long the cycle is to make things happen, um, but I think we expressed to them that there are things that we've started as many as 10, 15 years ago on council and they're just coming to fruition now, so. I think we've got an eager group and I'm, I'm look forward to our first real meetings where we can accomplish some things. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you for those comments. And I echo, I was really happy to see Deputy Mayor Armour there as well. Um, yes, Councillor Lenly. Thank you, Your Worship. And just a, um, I guess maybe a point of order, but um, unfortunately I was unable to attend that meeting. And on the, um, uh, in the minutes, it does state that I seconded an adoption of the agenda during the meeting, which I did not. So. We can make that adjustment. I didn't even so notice that. I just oh. noticed it okay. now. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, um, okay. Uh, right. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, are there any other questions? No. Nope. Okay. I will go, uh, call the question. We. I read the motion. All those in favor? And that carries. And with that, I am turning the meeting over to Councillor Schumacher. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, we are still morning. Okay, that's good. So, under new business, I have 9.1 community services and 9.1.1. Greg is here to speak to report number CS 2023 10, proposed update of the special event bylaw. And I have a motion moved by Scott Moore or Councillor Morrison and seconded by Councillor Stone. It is recommended that bylaw number 2017-115 be repealed and replaced with the new draft special event bylaw as attached to report CS 2023-10 and further that the draft bylaw be provided to council for consideration. And Greg is here to speak. Thank you. And through you, Chair Schumacher, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you this morning about this. I know you've had a lot of event talk already today so this doesn't deal with the fees that I know have been have been dealt with that would be a different different topic but this is a little bit of a housekeeping cleanup on our special event bylaw uh, we initiated the bylaw in 2015 late first year of, of the uh, seat team the special event advisory team was 2016 and obviously we had some uh, slower years in 2020 and 21 due to the pandemic and now is the time for a, uh, another update. We did an update in 2017 after two years and then we were planning an update probably right around the beginning of the pandemic and that was put on hiatus. So just some small housekeeping changes um, with some additional members to the team for, for review, the BIA and the chamber as part of the, um, to make sure that it, uh, you know, they're, they're aware of the events that are taking place in the downtown core. Um, that was done a few years ago. Uh, some definitions were adjusted, little small updates on the uh, application, and uh, just some of the language regarding the, uh, the bylaw offenses and penalties were, were changed. Uh, just a little update for everybody, we've done 124 seat applications since the beginning of the program. Um, it's very well supported by the OPP, uh, Simcoe Muskoka District Health, the uh, 
uh, Muskoka Paramedic Services, Fire Department. So it's been a great streamline for everybody as a one-stop shop for everybody to um, have one person as a point of contact for your groups and then we liaise with everybody else. And I know it's really well supported by the District of Muskoka as well. And even as the pandemic came through, it was bringing Simcoe District Health on and getting those events like Ironman that were able to proceed in 2021 during a pandemic. The C team's been very valuable in making sure we're dotting our I's, crossing our T's, and making sure all the liabilities and insurances are in place for the town. So I'm happy to have to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Greg? Mayor Johnson? Thank you, Chair Schumacher. And very quick one, Greg. I, I'm not sure um, I really like the C um, application pro, um, process, and I'm wondering, do they have a similar process in Bracebridge and Gravenhurst when they go through their events, do you know? And through you, Chair, Chair Schumacher. Um, I, I've been asked a couple times to share our, our bylaws and our information, which I'm more than happy to. I, n I don't think they've adopted the same special event advisory team in, in the other municipalities, um, but we'd be happy to share at any time for sure. Deputy Mayor Armand, did you have a comment or a question? Oh, thank you, through you, Chair. And Greg, um, good report. I'm just curious with the insurance aspect in here because you removed all that, all the numbers out of that. Is that, I'm just wondering why you removed that out of the contract, actually. Thank, thank you, and through, through you, Chair Schumacher. It was to line it up with the uh, external insurance policy so that if there's any changes to that, it, it's referring to the external insurance policy so that we're not having the insurance in multiple places. Um, and it's, it, this will kind of, centralize it in one, in one location. And I think there's another report. I think, I think Julia wants to add in. Julia, our treasurer, would like to add. Um, I just want to make note that um, later on in the agenda on section, um, on section 9.3.11, we actually have an update to that policy for in external insurance requirements. So we've, we've mirrored it over to that at the same time. Yeah, thanks for that. It, it just doesn't have to be referenced in the seat program, that's all. In that. Councillor Reinwick? Thank you, Chair Schumacher. Just a, a comment and a, and a couple of, say one question. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for the, um, uh, the presentation. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that the BIA and the Chamber of Commerce are now part of the seat application uh, team. Uh, they have some of the biggest events in downtown, so that's a good thing. Um, my question is, um, I've got, actually I've got two questions, but one, there's no definition of what a barrier or a, a barricade is within the actual application. And I know having been with the BIA, it was always a challenge to um, close the road. And within this document, it says that you actually have to refer to the Ontario Traffic Manual, Book 7, which I happen to have a copy of here. This is really difficult to negotiate and to figure out. I guess I'm going to follow up with my question. So my question is, there's no definition about barrier or barricade. This is really complicated, and I know you're there to help groups go through it, but why doesn't the town have a system of barricades that if an event came forward and said, listen, we need to close the road, the town already has a barricade there to say, rent it from us, we'll put it out for you, we'll charge you whatever, a, a fee. Is that a possibility? Um, so I'm asking a couple of things, but yeah. thank you. I think it's, I think it's a oh, sorry. <laughs> Are you going to defer yeah, to the director? Lines. If you allow, if, yeah, if you allow Tarmo to yeah. take that one. Tarmo, we're going to defer to that director. Okay. Through you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'm going to get you the newest version. That's a very old version of Book 7. Um, so Book 7 is complicated, um, as are the liability issues associated with closing roadways. Uh, and the required expertise um, the event organizers need to know what the traffic plan is uh, for their own insured purposes and have to design the traffic plan. We would review it and help them make sure that everything's, you know, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed on that. Um, each plan, even though it seems like every event would have the same closures, would vary um, considerably. Um, and when the actual plan changes considerably, so too do the need for barricades. We don't have all of the required barricades. We don't have those in stock, that we just don't stock them. We typically, for roads crews, we rent those from uh, various different organizations for road works that we require them for. Um, and 
the um, and so in, in right now we don't have these events typically happen on weekends and we are not staffed to have roads crews come in erect the barriers and take them down so what we have worked out with the BIA is they go uh, they design the traffic plan they work the, um, they rent the required barriers and barricades our crews will put them up um, they, they set them aside our crews will actually put them up for the BIA and then at the end of the event we'll take them down um, but it, it has to be their plan they have to own that the event organizer has to own that plan and that mirrors the uh, districts um, how the district operates on district roadways with that follow up thank you uh, and thank you for that director uh, Yuviki. The, the the question is that um, the plan can sometimes be so overwhelming if you if you abide by the rules and the the traffic plan that's in in this manual and thank you for the update if there is a, a newer one so you, there's no opportunity for the town to have those barricades available for um, events that's what you're saying we can't do that through you chair I'm not saying that we can't I'm saying we don't right now okay. so uh, we can do anything um, <laughs> but we don't currently have that available thank you Any other questions for Greg? Oh, you have a question or a comment? No, I don't have a question, but I was just gonna do a little bit of a follow-up. I am working with the district on a standard for a, a road closure, because the district has put in, in a parameter as well, requiring a book seven approved by a traffic management company. That's a new parameter that just came out from the district about two months ago. So I've worked with the chamber and been speaking with Ellen with the BIA, and, and because the standard road closure for a BIA chamber event is usually um, center to Brunel, Main Street, and it's kind of the same closure every time. So I'm working right now on behalf of the, those organizations to have a set plan that has a diagram and all the pictures and the detour routes and the proper barricades and signage. It's in the process right now to be approved by a traffic management firm. And I've got a permission from the district that once that's approved, that that'll be the set parameter for those organizations, that they can just get that plan from me and it'll it'll move forward. Now the barricades is the, is the different, where we get the barricades is a rental still at this time, but at least the parameters around the book seven, I'll have a set up plan that I just hand to the client and, and they won't have to do any work on that except execute it by making the rentals to a company in town, Sunbelt as an example. Follow up? Just thank you, <laughs> Chair. I, I guess, and it, maybe it leads to what um, the mayor had mentioned about, does, does Bracebridge have such an extensive policy? And if, if, if I was an, a, a new organizer of an event coming to Huntsville and I had to jump through quite a few hoops to get this and I don't have, I'm not the BIA, I'm not the Chamber of Commerce, there's a lot of things you gotta do that this would really scare me off, like a lot of things that happen. And I might go to Bracebridge to do the event. I know you're there to help with the event and, and so, Further to that, if we have to have barricades, why couldn't the town have barricades within that plan through book seven? And maybe that's a further discussion we have. So, I, well, how much money, but you know, you charge, the, you charge the individual groups to pay for the ability to use those barricades according to the, the, the official plan, as well as the putting out and taking them down. So it, it just makes it, more, it makes it easier. This is very complicated. Thank you. <laughs> any <laughs> any other questions for Greg? No. Okay. Just <coughs> thank you. <laughs> through through you, I am happy to see this. I, I especially like the short turnaround opportunity for you know parades and whatnot. That if somebody does win something, it does allow now for us to be able to do that. Which I know the um, other bylaw didn't necessarily speak to that. So I'm happy to see that change. Um, I don't really want to throw you a loophole here but next steps is to work on the policy itself is that correct yeah. okay correct. so we have had some conversations around events earlier today so I guess my ask would be do we look at again to that point around <coughs> the ask piece and whatnot for special events can we maybe outline the policy to look at people coming first before doing deputations or how we fill that out in the policy so that it is well understood, I guess, from groups itself. Mayor Alcock, do you 
Uh, thank you, Chair Schumacher. So I'm wondering, um, with given what you just said, are you suggesting an amendment to the, the motion that you just read, or because you're providing does it further need an amendment? Because he know the next step is I'm a policy. So I'm, I'm direction. Do I have to clerk. give the actual direction, or I just figured I knew they were working on it? <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Schumacher. I'm, I was thinking actually of Councillor Renwick's request if she was wanting a motion on the floor. My apologies. Thank you, um, Tanya. I, I would actually like to amend this motion to have, um, and, and just to be clear, is it coming back to us after, the motion's on the table right now just to accept it the way it is. I would like to see a, a, the, the amendment be or the change be that um, to investigate having these barricades and that's I'll say one part of it. Is that? For a policy. For a policy, yeah. For you, Chair Schumacher. Mm. Um, I can uh, make an amendment here that staff bring back information on costs and staffing to in order to amend the policy further, but this policy and amendment would go forward as is, if, if that would be sufficient. That's sufficient. Yep. No, now I'm confused. Yeah. We're talking about a bylaw here versus a policy, correct? Or no? The policy is before you today, so if committee agrees for it to be approved, then it will filter through to council. Uh, direction can be provided for staff to provide uh, information regarding costing for the barricades and perhaps process related around that. There'd obviously have to be a process about utilizing those barricades. Uh, but if committee approves the, the report today, it would go as is. But further information can be provided, and then if if committee decides to make changes whereby we are providing those, then the policy would have to be amended accordingly. <coughs> and, and if I could just add one more thing to Councillor Wen Rick's comments about, it is very difficult to follow. But the, the the great thing about it is it's typically the same organizations that we're working with, so they're very familiar with it. Um, however, having said that, if we did have a new organization, Greg would definitely work very closely with them. But it's overwhelming. I know when I looked at it, I'm like, oh. Oh, that's really overwhelming, but they're, they're used to it, I, I guess I could say. So you're dealing with the Chamber and the BIA and, and maybe Huntsville Festival of the Arts, so, um, or if it's Iron Man. So if it's if people who aren't familiar with it, then Greg would certainly provide that support. Uh, Councillor Alcock, although, can I just make it? So it says bylaw number here, not a policy. For you, Chair Schumacher, it is a policy that's done by bylaw. Councillor Alcock, no, oh, okay, you just had your your light on. Councillor, I just say one more thing. Another part of the policy or the, the bylaw also states that you have to have trained volunteers to man those barriers. Uh, okay, that's great. We, who trains them, and do we still? Actually, that was another question. Do we still have the volunteer um, volunteer coordination group that was through the town of Huntsville? Is that still around? Maybe two. Chamber does. Thank you. Okay, Councilor <laughs> Mayor Alcock, you do have a question. Uh, so I, I do. I was just thinking that um, Chair Schumacher, um, the clerk has typed up a potential amendment, and maybe if you put it on Perfect. the screen, it might then then the mover could look at it and okay. see if that satisfies. So it is moved by Helena. Do we have a seconder? Mayor Alcock? Seconded. It is recommended that bylaw number 2017-115 be repealed and replaced with the new draft special event bylaw as attached to report CS 2023-10. The draft bylaw be provided to council for consideration and further that staff report back on costs and staffing to provide and train applicants on barricades for special events. Yes. If I could, Chair Schumacher, so you've already read the motion. This okay. is just the amendment and the amendments the oh, red. Oh, just the red. So the amended part is the end further that staff report back to. Correct. Okay, the red part. As we're crafting right at the moment, we could make changes if that's not sufficient to uh, Councillor Renwick. Thank you, uh, Chair, if, if I may. Um, staff is reporting back on the cost of staffing, but also the cost of, of having those barricades 
Yeah, okay, yep, it does. Thank you, that's good. CAO Corey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I ju I'm just, I have to admit I'm slightly confused, so I'm thinking my team is confused as well. So staff report back on costs. So my understanding was the suggestion was we purchase the barricades. So A, let's find out how much that would cost. And B, are, so you're also suggesting that we provide the training to the applicants? Uh, I, I, perhaps we start with we find out how much the barricades cost and a recommended process around the utilization of those barricades, something similar to that. Chair Schumacher? Yeah. If, that, if I may, through you, Chair Schumacher. I, I think that's what was confusing me as well, um, CAO Corey. I think it's more the, the cost of the barricades okay. um, for special events. The training is a separate issue, and I, I, I brought that up later on, so perhaps we should just look at this. Um, and whether or not we wanted to pro provide, provide those barricades yeah. on occasions for events or for groups to use. Is that something that... So if I may, Madam Chair, so yeah. and further that staff report back on the costs associated with providing barricades Thank you. to be utilized for special events. And in all fairness to our clerk, she's just trying to figure out what, we're, what we want here. So if, if that's okay with the committee, then... Um, staff report back on the costs for barricades to provide for special at special events. I would think. Yes. Dep okay, Deputy Mayor Armour, do you have a yes, Chair? Uh, thank you very this? much, Chair. Um, I'm just curious. These barricades. It's not that something that the BIA or the um, chambers should look after and then they can rent them out and they can make the money off them? Is it something the town has to be involved with? I'm just curious. Through you, Chair Schumacher, I, at, at present, and, I, and I, I, could be, I could be wrong, but there are so many different kinds of barricades out there, but if you go by what this is, the official plan of Book 7, it, heaven forbid that we ever have an event and the barricades that are there are pylons and we have a car that comes careening down the main street and goes through. If, if we don't I mean, it's, maybe it's with insurance as well, but I think those barricades have to be something that's substantial and that would potentially stop a car, but little little pine, little cones are not gonna work. So I think there has to be a consistency, and I think if it's our event as a town, I think it would be really advantageous for us or, or prudent for us to have a barricade that would protect the, the event in downtown, and I think the town should take on some of that responsibility. That's my concern. Greg is going to respond to that, and then Monty, I do have. Um, thank you, through you, Chair Schumacher. Um, there is a current agreement with the Chamber that uh, is in place, I believe, until 2024. It's an equipment agreement, and the Chamber has in the past had that equipment. So that, that has existed and is still currently valid. Um, I don't think they have the, the, the ex exact equipment. The, the seat process has eliminated the, the possibility of has having the wrong equipment for a barricade. So it was, it was about four years ago, 2019, I think there was an event where the OPP refused to allow the barricades to be used, and the town provided the barricades last minute on that case, on that the exact event, it was a midnight madness. Since that date, the barricades have had a, a, a book seven approved format that I've been providing to customers since that date. So I've been able to provide them exactly what their needs are so they're not using wrong barricades. It's been approved by the districts and the town and the OPP. So that's been in place. This bylaw change is just you know, putting that language into the bylaw so that we have it there formally, which it wasn't there before. Um, it was changing, you can see in the bylaw, it was taking away that the, the clients and the organizer would do that. But we do have that process in place to ensure the proper barricades are there, just because we had that incident. Follow up, sorry, <laughs> and then Monty. So you're saying we do have barricades that are book seven approved, that can be used? For you, Chair Schumacher, I have a diagram of what the barricades are and a list of exactly with pictures that show the exact barricades you must use. They still need to be rented from a company. We don't provide them from the town. God, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, there's companies out there that they can rent them. Yeah. Correct. Monty. Through you. Um, I think with the barricades, I understand where you're coming from with this, but I mean, are we getting into the barricade rental business? Uh, the big thing is with this here, for the amount of time they're being used, the money that would tie up, the manpower, the equipment, the storage, uh, to to keep this you know the around, uh, when there is rental companies that are available in town, 
not too far away in Bracebridge. I know there's a fair company that rents that. So I think if it, if it's provide if we provide what they need, and we make sure that they can get those in it, okay. If they can't get them in the Muskokas, then wherever. But as long as we like we are providing them what they need, for us to purchase them and store them and place them, I just think it'd be a lot more for our staffing, storage, cost. You know, like when stuff like that is available for rental. Uh, you're good. Mayor Alcock. Thank you, Chair Schumacher. I, I think that the proposed amendment is just fine the way it is because it's not suggesting that we actually have to purchase them. It's just exploring the costs. And what I'm understanding from Councillor Renwick, who has been through this process, has looked at the red book and is saying it's really complicated if there's a, a role for the town to, to step in and, and help sort through that. Um, and then so, you know, it would be interesting to find out what the costs are. So if we have the contact as to the rental of them or whatever role we can play, then I think that's not a bad suggestion. But all the amendment is doing is saying, let's explore the costs, and it's not necessarily purchasing them. So that, that um, is why I support it for sure, the amendment. Thank you. Yes, so yes, the amendment is just to take staff time to research cost and not necessarily to purchase. Because as you say, it is locally, we do have people who meet requirement for this book and you can direct them to there. And a local business gets the revenue. Perfect, okay. So does the amendment, oh, Greg? Uh, through you, Chair Schumacher, that process, it, it's, about, it's just under $300 the last time I quoted it for the cost for the barricades um, from a local in Huntsville supplier so it, it's becomes part of the organizing cost for an event but that's that was about the rental cost for them um, his, historically going back I know we did go through this back in 2017 or 18 because we did used to provide the barricades you'd be well aware <laughs> council Renwick when we, we when we used to drop them off when you were with the BIA and then I, I think over time there was a cost associated with that that was that was presented from from Public Works at the time of being I, I believe it was a little over two thousand dollars with the labor and the pickup and the drop off on the weekends and stuff, and that was where it came to that the, the clients and we went through the rental process, and that's where the change was made. So that, that was just the historic on his, history on it that I am aware of. So, are we putting the? Or I'm calling the question to the amendment. Correct. Okay. So. The amendment. All in favor of adding to the amendment. <laughs> so now the main motion as amended. Right? Oh, all in favor. Sorry. All in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? Okay. It still carries. Thank you. Now, now I have to move it over to Councillor Morrison to take over the chair. Thank you for that riveting discussion on seat. Thank you, Chair Schumacher. Um, I have about 75 motions here today, so <laughs> you're going to be hearing from me for quite a while. Um, here for a good time, not a long time. Okay, so uh, first up we have um, uh, 9.3 corporate services, 9.3.1. Andrew Zanier and uh, CEO Corey uh, are going to present another st strategic plan status update. So first I'll read the motion. We have a motion passed by Mayor Alcock, uh, seconded by Deputy Mayor Armour, whereas the 2019-2023 strategic plan's end date is nearing and the plan contains some outstanding items. And whereas Report Corp. 2023-4 calls for the procurement of a consultant for the 2023 to 2027 strategic plan. Now, therefore, it is recommended that committee direct staff to focus on the following organizational business plan projects for the remainder of 2023. Uh, one, community improvement plan, CIP affordable housing. Number two, uh, new pedestrian linkages in town, a new sidewalk on Muskoka Road 3 North. Three, Pittman's Bay plan, and four, corporate communi communications plan. So with that, I'll pass over to 
Mr. Zinn. Thank you, thank, thank you, Chair Morrison. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so the purpose of the uh, the report in front of you is uh, is uh, twofold. Uh, first, we're uh, just providing a, uh, a status update to the uh, current uh, plan. I believe the last uh, the last uh, update was was around six months ago. A few things have changed since then, so we figured it was a good time to uh, uh, to show some of the changes that have uh, made over since that time. And the um, with the in regards to the second item, um, so during uh, during our discussions with uh, senior leadership, there was a. Um, a discussion to uh, uh, to address the uh, the outstanding items in in the uh, business plans, which are approximately uh, 17 of them. Um, and from that discussion, we uh, uh, we narrowed it down to the uh, four four items that are uh, on the list. Now, I do I do want to uh, um, make it a point of saying that uh, of the items that are uh, not on this list, um, it's not a question of uh, whether or not they're less important now or, or there's no uh, priority for them. That's not really what we're trying to say here, uh, but rather that um, these items are now uh, captured in a, in a different manner than, um, than when this plan was originally uh, established. And maybe just to give you a couple of examples of that, uh, say the, um, uh, the one item is the establishment of, the, uh, of an accessibility fund. Um, something like that is uh, is uh, it's really no longer optional for us to uh, kind of parcel out accessibility. It's uh, it is it is it is law of the province, and something like that is is uh, would be more of an operational item. It's not really something that's kind of special and created for a special occasion. We have to consider in everything we do, so that's why something like that wasn't put forward. Uh, another example that uh, I'd like to maybe highlight is uh, say the redevelopment of uh, of um, uh, Lions Lookout. So that's uh, that's a, that's a recommendation that was uh, born out of the uh, waterfront strategy and the community services master plan, and uh, because of that, that is now under the purview of uh, that that new committee that has been uh, now struck. Now, and just maybe to, just to compare it to say the the one item on the list, uh, new pedestrian linkages, um, that item has actually has seen some s uh, serious progression since uh, the sidewalk master plan was uh, adopted back in 20, uh, 2019. And uh, actually, just as recently as uh, two nights ago, you did hear a small update on that pertaining to uh, a report uh, brought to council for uh, Anthony Court and uh, Meadow Park Drive. Um, so I hope I hope that gives a little bit more context to the uh, nature of the report. And uh, if there's any uh, questions, I'd be uh, happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And over to Mayor Alcock. Thank you, uh, Chair Morrison and Andrew. Great report. Um, really interesting reading what we have done. A lot of stuff. It's it's kind of cool. Um, I was curious about the four recommended um, projects for uh, completing in the remain by the end of 2023. What, one in particular, the community improvement plan for affordable housing, and I, I think um, I know that I, I was really excited about that project at one point. Um, and I still obviously think it's a really interesting project and worthwhile going through. Having said that, um, it's a significant undertaking, and um, I was sort of curious about uh, if I could, through you to Director Maxwell, what her thinking is around that, um, and if we put money in the budget, because is this something that, um, that we would do internally? Through you, Chair Morrison, um, it's, it is something that we have talked about for quite a number of years. And with all of the recent changes the province has made to um, funding, development charges, affordable housing, and, and not having finalized what they're doing yet, we thought it would be appropriate to look at our affordable housing policy that we have now that we know isn't as effective as it could be and do a comprehensive review. And so that would be step one, is review everything we have, what we can do, what we can change, and then determine at that point if a CIP is actually the, the approach we should take or not and go from there. So it's it's listed as a CIP because that's the goal that we were working on initially, but it, it could be something slightly different, but it's we're just at the beginning of that process, and at this point, I don't think we would need a consultant if we did choose to do a CIP, so. Okay, follow up, Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, and, th and through you, um, thank you for that response, and I, that makes all the sense in the world, um, you know, working towards a CIP if that is the best tool in which to implement policies. But essentially what you're talking about is doing an internal review and seeing what is working, what's not working, what we might beef up. 
and it might be working towards a CIP, but it might be working towards something else. So it's really the labeling of the project. That, okay, that's helpful, thank you. Okay, Councilor Stone. Thank you. Um, I, I like to talk to new pedestrian linkages in town and new sidewalks. So this is directly uh, something that our new active transportation committee is looking at. So is there overlap? Is there, is the new consultant going to work towards this? If so, then the active transportation shouldn't, or vice versa. Through, through you, Chair Morrison, um, I think I'd like to maybe just have uh, uh, Director uh, uh, Director UKV maybe speak to that a, a little bit more, if that's uh, if that's okay with the Director. Through you, Chair, um, it would be most appropriate probably to have it the work done through um, the Active Transportation Committee. Um, we the presentation of the where we are with the design um, works already underway for the sidewalk master plan are scheduled to be presented at that committee al already. Um, so I would I would suggest that's probably the best route to move forward with that. So my question is, does it come off this list? Okay, CEO Corey, I'd like to address that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it's interesting because when the senior leadership team was reviewing this. We had it on, we took it off. We had it on, we took it off. And then we just knew a lot of the conversation that was happening around this table with respect to the importance of specifically Muskoka Road 3, and we didn't want it to be perceived as it wasn't recognized as an important item. So to be honest with you, we, we left it on there to recognize the importance, it is correct. And if committee wishes for it to be removed from the strategic plan, we're perfectly fine with that. We were just a little bit apprehensive because of the importance of that particular issue. That's why we left it on. So if, if committee feels comfortable with having that continue through the, the, the committee, the transportation committee, staff would be very supportive of that. Okay, Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Chair Morrison. Very briefly, I, I would say um, to Councillor Stone, it absolutely stays in there. It's, it's still a real, it's an important priority. It's just the tool, it's where it's going. Your committee um, is dealing with it, but it's, it's a high, it's one of four top priorities. That's the way I, I see it anyway. So, so follow up. Yeah, j just is the new consultant going to deal with this then? Because if if I may, if I may, I believe what I'm reading is that we are looking to get a consultant to deal with the new strategic plan. However, in the meantime, for the remainder of 2023, we also want to focus on these four things. So I think they're actually separate. If you know what I mean. Uh, so the consultant and these four initiatives are not related. Is that correct? Okay. Councillor Schumacher. Thank you, through you, uh, Chair Morrison to Andrew. Um, did you say accessibility fund has been removed or because it still says in progress? So th through you, Chair Morrison. So it's, um, it, it's, not, it's not removed uh, from the plan, but I think it's, it, was, um, it was identified through the senior leadership that um, it really shouldn't just be like a standalone, it's, it's not really a standalone item anymore as opposed to uh, something that we should be doing uh, when we do our day-to-day -day work. Uh, so anytime we go for new, like a new service or build something new, uh, we have to consider accessibility in, um, in, our, in everything we do. It may not have been as evident maybe when we created this uh, because we're, we were, I think the intention was to kind of create something separate, but you can't really treat accessibility as a separate item. You have to, you have to consider it for quite literally everything we do. And I think this is just to kind of uh, acknowledge that and just kind of update or, or acknowledge the fact that uh, our, our way of doing things is now uh, progressed in, in, in that way. Yeah, follow, okay. follow up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I just, because it says accessibility fund, so we were looking, and I know we did do like a one-time opportunity for people to access. I don't think it was as well received. It could have been the timing around COVID possibly. I guess my, my point too, when it comes to funding, are we making sure people are aware of what's out there for accessibility funding. I'm thinking of the Curling Club and their, you know, next two years is a big push to make themselves accessible. I believe they missed the opportunity for a February grant. So how do we make, you know, com the community out there aware that there are accessibility funds that they can tap into? So, uh, through Chair Morrison, so I think that's, um, 
I think that's really going to be something that staff will have to uh, work, work work hard to uh, to make make sure that 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 information is being uh, relayed to these uh, to these applicants. So, uh, say in the for the current curling club, for example, I know our, our CBO is very um, is very proactive in, in, in informing applicants of what their uh, requirements are for uh, meeting a the AODA standards. Uh, so we will just continue just to do to do that, and to, and if we are aware of any uh, funding available through for you know so the province or the federal government, then we would if we know that, then we would happily relay that to them as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I have a, a quick comment if I could um, on the sidewalk master plan, which I, I love that we're focusing on that. And Director Yukavi and we had a chat in the last meeting just about uh, asphalt versus uh, sidewalk slabs. Um, I guess going forward, and maybe this is a question for Director Yukavi, is there going to be a, a consistent mandate of what we want from that? I mean, I think we've talked about accessibility, people in wheelchairs, they want asphalt, not concrete slabs. Uh, and it sounds like from a costing perspective, it's better to have asphalt and from a repair and maintenance perspective. And other than maybe an aesthetic appeal and my boyhood love of not stepping on a crack because I don't want something to happen to my mom's back. I don't know, I don't know if there's a real reason to have uh, concrete blocks, if you will. So, so Director Yukivi, if you can speak to that. Thank you, Chair Morrison. Um, you hit most of the highlights of that. Um, the discussion about um, concrete versus asphalt would first have to take the kind of legislated minimum maintenance standards requirement view. Um, there are certain sidewalks that would need to be concrete um, just because of the way the, the, that's structured. However, for the ones that we have a choice as to whether they're concrete or asphalt, we would go with um, Council's direction on that. Uh, based on that, we would make the presentation and make the have the discussion probably through the uh, Active Transportation Committee to start. Um, and, and then that would become whatever the standard that we go with. Concrete is very expensive. We don't have the in-house expertise to do the maintenance. We would be contracting those services out, even for the maintenance portion. Uh, with asphalt, the advantage is it's cheaper to lay down, and it, we would um, have the in-house expertise to maintain it um, through the life of it. Uh, so. Uh, that's perfect, and obviously, Councillor Stone, that's in your purview on, on your committee. So, and I believe having uh, someone like Deb Kerwin on your committee, that'll be something that'll be encouraged. So, okay, perfect, awesome. Great, uh, well, I believe if there's no more questions, I can call the question. All in favor? Okay, and that is carried. I guess I have to sign something. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, moving along to 9.3.2, we're gonna have uh, Margaret Stead um, on report number Corp 2023-25, proposed amendment to bylaw 2021-52 road name approvals. So I will read the motion. Um, moved by Councillor Renwick, seconded by Councillor Stone. It is recommended that committee approves the following amendments to bylaw 2021-52 consolidated list of road names for 911 civic addressing purposes. Additions, uh, one Stillwater Lane, private. Number two, Sinclair Road East, town. Number three, Bethune Road North, town unassumed. Number four, Abraham Road, town unassumed. And further that, the amending bylaw be forwarded to council for consideration following the required provision of notice. So I'll pass it over to you, Margaret. Thank you, uh, good morning. Uh, chair and, uh, and committee. Uh, the report is uh, fairly straightforward. Over the last couple of years, we've done a few of these uh, road naming uh, processes. Uh, it follows our road naming uh, policy that we established in 2016. Um, to highlight, uh, Stillwater Lane is uh, located on a development on the north end of Lake Vernon. On the map there, uh, Sinclair Road East, prove addressing numbering along um, the kind of eastern segment. Uh, Bethune Road North uh, amendment uh, to uh, unassumed portion, unmaintained portion. And Abraham Road, uh, the location on the map showing the top of uh, Florence Street uh, near the towers. So we thought it was um, relevant at this time to make that road name change. Uh, Summit Street, there's a Summit Drive in a, in a local neighbor, residential neighborhood. So it's best to kind of clean that up now. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Margaret. Any questions from council? 
Okay, Councillor Renwick. Thank you, Chair Morrison. Through you uh, to Margaret. Just a comment. I, I like the names that have been chosen, and I think the I like the history behind uh, the Abraham um, uh, designation. I thought that was an interesting, uh, nice way of doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Renwick. Any other questions at all? Okay. With that, I'll call the question. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, moving on. I have Jessica next. So item 9.3.3, Jessica Boys, report number Corp 2023-8 legal and agreements staff delegated approvals. This is for information only, so no motion. Thank you, Chair Morrison. Um, this report is just with, re with respect to staff delegated approvals um, from last year. So there were two licenses and 15 shore and road allowance closure applications. Well, that was a quick one. That's great. Um, okay, any questions from council on that? I guess you're off the hook, Jessica. Thank you so much. I know. <laughs> Probably see your nail. Yeah, you are a lot. Um, moving right along to um, 9.3.4. Um, speaking to, do I need to introduce Jessica for each one or just mention what she's speaking to? Okay. So Jessica will speak into Corp 2023 20 permanent highway closure policy amendment. And I do have a motion on this one. Um, moved by Councillor Schumacher, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, it is recommended that committee approves the permanent highway closure policy attached as Appendix 1 to Corp 2023-20 and rescinds original road and shore road allowance closure policy development-07. And further that the provision of notice policy and acquisition and disposition policy be amended in accordance with Corp 2023-20 and further that bylaws be forwarded to Council for final consideration. Chair Morrison. Uh, so this is the permanent highway closure policy. The previous policy is four years old and it warranted some amendments uh, based on changing times and feedback I've received from applicants and here at the table. So the biggest amendment that you will see to the policy is the name change. This was formerly the shore and road allowance closure policy and the name has been updated to Permanent Highway Closure Policy. This is to align with the Municipal Act. Um, original roads and shore road allowances have been defined as highways under the Municipal Act for 20 years, and I thought for consistency we could update this policy as well. Um, there's a number of other changes. I won't go through each and every change. Um, just updating to current practices and uh, processes. Um, since the original policy was drafted, the applications were moved um, from the planning department to legislative services, so there's been some updates with respect to that. Um, we've also moved a lot more towards electronic processing, and the policy has been updated to align with electronic application, electronic documents, and electronic notice. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions from Council? Councillor Stone. Thank you. Some comments about um, public notification. And I have a problem with this as well as with our planning notification. Um, um, re we're removing the notification in the newspaper. Um, I'm okay with that because I think it was poorly done to begin with. Um, advertising on our website is not good public information. If somebody has to dig deep in a website and even know to go to the website is, is not good sharing. Um, the one item in here, you're removing circulation to abutting landowners. Um, I, I don't agree with that. I think it should still be, the neighbor should still know if it's going to be removed. Go ahead, Jessica. 
Thank you uh, through you, Chair Morrison, to Councillor Stone. So um, the, the circulation to the abutting landowners is not being removed. It, um, the, the requirement of the applicant to complete that process is being removed and it's being put on staff. Uh, applicants ha have found, you know, changing times. Um, everyone used to know their neighbors and know how to reach their neighbors, and now people are having issues, you know, reaching their abutting landowners. Um, and we have access to the address database for taxes, and we can use that to notify them. And so that is coming in house rather than with the applicants. And uh, with respect to the website notice, I did speak with marketing about that. And we can set up a specific, um, a specific way that people can sign up to receive an email every time that that is posted on the website for this specific process. Um, we're also going to go through sort of a transition period where we notify in the paper that it is moving to the website. So it's not just going to be moved to the website immediately. Um, the next few cycles that I have a bylaw coming forward, I will notify in the paper, please go to our website to uh, see the notice. Okay, that's good, Councillor Stone. Um, as far as on the website goes, I know, I think our website is very robust, has a ton of information. Is when people go to the website, I don't want to make it too busy, but is there a way to have a, a fairly glaring tab for public notices so people can quickly click on the stuff they need? If we go into search, we know to dig deep and to get into interactive mapping and whatnot, but is that something we could do so the public sees that stand out for them when they go on? Um, I think I would have to defer to Director Maxwell as that would be a marketing question. Director Maxwell. Thank you, Chair Morrison. It, um, we do have banners that go across the top. So if you go to the homepage, anything that's current or new that's changing, it, it slides across. And, and there are notices that can be uh, uh, sort of more prominent. But it's something that we can definitely work with um, Miss Boys with and make sure that the notices are prominent. OK, thank you, because I concur with Bob. The more notice we can give to the public, the better. And the uh, ease of access is always great. So it sounds like we're already equipped. That's good. Any other questions, Councillor Clark? Thank you, Chair Morrison. Um, I'd just like to say how thankful I am that you're chairing today's meeting <laughs> with this large agenda, so thank you. Um, <laughs> I do have a, a question through you to Jessica. More of a comment that came up through our uh, corporate services meeting, but I understand why we're trying to update the policy name. I have a a small concern about removing the word shore road allowance because I, I think it could be confusing to the public when we post agendas. So, um, because they w it might be confusing when they're, we're referring to a highway as opposed to a shore road allowance. I, I don't know if we need to change anything to do with the motion, but I think it'd be helpful to have it at least in the subject line um, of um, specific reports that are posted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. That's good. Through you, Chair Morrison, to Councillor Clark. Thank you for your comments. And yes, absolutely, we can keep the name as is and do in brackets, you know, OSRA closure or something along those lines um, if that helps with keeping the public up to date. Okay, thank you. And we did discuss that at our at our meeting, and I, I do think the general public will think we're closing Highway 60 or something like that, right? So, so I do like uh, your plan to make it consistent with what it's actually called, but having the short allowance still included is good. And to Councillor Clark's comment, we've got four years together. I'll be having you sharing some of these uh, meetings before you know it, so we've got lots of time. Uh, any other questions around the table? Councillor Renwick. Just a comment, Chair um, Morrison, that if we're closing highways, I want to talk about barricades, please. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, people. Um, anything else on that? Okay. Being noted, uh, call the question. All in favor? And carried. Okay, now moving on to. It's Jessica Day. Um, we are now moving on to report number Corp 2023-21, 
con OSRA, OSRA closure dash 835 Stevenson Road to East. And I do have a motion on this one as well. It's a long one. Okay, this one is moved by Mayor Alcock and seconded by Councilor Cloutier. It is recommended that application RC 22 slash 2022 be approved in accordance with original shore slash road allowance closing policy development dash 07, conditional on, one, the applicant pay all survey, legal, and associated expenses, two, the sale price for the OSRA proposed to be closed be in accordance with the fees and charges bylaw in place at the time of approval. Three, a survey be provided showing the unflooded and flooded lands as specific parts on the plan. Four, a registered transfer deed of land for the OSRA be filed with the municipality within one year from the date of the motion. Approving the application or the motion will be considered null and void and a new application will be required. Five, that any utility plant located on the OSRA be proposed to be closed be given easements. Six, the OSRA is hereby declared a surplus to the town's needs and seven, the portion of the OSRA being closed, merge and title with the respective abutting lot. So I'll pass it over. Thank you, Chair Morrison. So yes, this is a shore road allowance closure um, at 835 Stevenson Road 2 East. Um, the applicant attempted to contact their neighbor and their neighbor was unresponsive. Uh, staff also attempted to contact the neighbor and they were unresponsive. Um, and as such, it is before committee for consideration. Um, I will make two comments in that this type of unresponsiveness will not come forward to committee um, under the policy amendment we just spoke about as long as the process of notifying has been completed. And uh, the, long, the long motion will not be on any future um, reports either as those are standard conditions for every application. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Any question on that topic? Hmm, I thought we'd get some on that one. Okay. Uh, that being noted, all in favor? And that's carried. And that's the end for you. Thank you, Jessica, for all your work on those reports. We are now moving on to 9.3.6 Lee Eccleston uh, regarding report number Corp 2023-18 status report on property taxes and this is for information only. So this, this is an information report, so I, I'm assuming at this point then that everybody has read through the status report for the taxes, and if there are any questions on the report, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Lee. Any questions on Lee's report on property taxes? Councillor Renwick? Thank, thank you, Chair Morrison. Through you to Lee. Um, uh, more of a comment. I was surprised at the number of... Um, uh, properties that are in arrears and how long that can continue on. So it, this is just more of a comment. I was being a new person to council. I was surprised at how much um, money is actually out there that's in arrears. Thank you. Through, you, through you, Chair Morrison, to Councilor Ronick. Uh, yes, and in, in fact, if, if you're looking at the numbers here too, it, we're bringing the numbers down in the arrears or the number of accounts that is coming down greatly. Um, some municipalities are a little, uh, a little harder on, on pushing out for the arrears for tax sales. Uh, some don't run tax sales at all. So there is a, there is a mix of municipalities. We, we, we obviously do run tax sales when properties are getting into a, a state, you know, as the report shows there too, where we do start pushing out and have been pushing a little harder lately on, uh, on ones. We've moved also fairly recently um, under the legislation from the properties that were in three years arrears to ones that are in two year full arrears and pushing those ones out for tax sale proceedings now too. Thank you for your question, Councillor Remick. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to maybe one comment. I know that the interest we charge on tax and arrears is quite low. Um, and I heard the, co I'll say I heard the comment from one person once, well, it's cheap money, why would I pay that when I could pay other things off? So I wonder, is there a, 
a thought at some point that maybe that rate could be increased to kind of as a deterrent for people or? Sir, to, 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 to you chair, that's law. Okay, that's law, okay. I legislated 15% so. maximum for the, for the interest charges. When I okay, answered. but we're much lower than that at the moment, we're, we're one, We are 15%. We so are? We're 1.25% per month. Okay, I thought we were much lower than that. Okay, thank you, Lee. Councilor Cloutier? Three years. Um, when we have to sell a property, do we have to sell a property or can the town keep the property? And I'm thinking affordable housing in the future for that property that we get. Do we have to sell a property by law or can we keep it and develop as affordable housing or that's basically what I want is affordable housing? Through you, Chair Morrison, to, to you, Councillor Cloutier. Uh, with the, the first process would be the, the offering of the property through the tendering process. Uh, through the tax, you know, through the municipal act of tax sale process, so um, the opportunity to vest the property in the town's interest wouldn't be available unless there was an unsuccessful purchase through the tax sale proceedings. So yes, yeah, that that would be the process. Okay, and land, land that is declared surplus by us, we can choose to keep or sell. But I think it's a tax sale; we have to try to to sell it, right? Okay. All right, any other questions on Lee's report? Okay, thank you for your help on that and the information. Okay, moving right along to 9.3.7. We have, uh, do we have, oh, we have Julia in place of Riva Frame on report number corp 2023-17 2022 council remuneration and expense and this is also for information only um, as this, in, this report is for information only i will um, just be available for any questions okay <laughs> it was a fairly simple report <laughs> i concur with that councillor stone uh, any other any other questions on that at all Okay, Julie, you're off the hook on that. <laughs> and we are now moving on to, well, speaking to that, um, Your Worship, at what point do we want to break for lunch? Is it? I, I put it around the table. Uh, do you want to get through? We have, I mean, I have. You have about 100 more items, I have 100 right? more items by scrolling through here, but right. it is. Right. 1223, should so we? Do you want to do it now? Do you want, maybe let Ian, because he's standing up, maybe let Ian do his report, and then, and then after Ian's, we'll take a lunch break. Sound good? Okay, great. Okay, so Ian will speak to, I scrolled down too far to see how many I had. Uh, 9.3.8, Ian Parker and uh, Claire Kalea will be speaking to report number Corp 2023-28. The communication tower inspection results at 40 Florence Street, 387 South Mary Lake Road, and 169 Medill Church Road. And I do have a motion to read on this one. It's also a long one. Um, moved by Deputy Mayor Armour, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald, whereas in July 2022, Council directed staff to procure a third party to conduct inspections on the town's three communication towers. Now, therefore, it is recommended that staff be directed to, one, complete all required repairs on the town's communication towers, located at 40 Florence Street and 387 South Mary Lake Road, the Port Sydney Fire Hall, at an approximate cost of $20,000 to be taken from the working funds reserve. And two, work with Lakeland Networks on a rental agreement for their equipment currently located on the 40 Florence Street Tower. And three, work with Lakeland Networks on a potential cost sharing agreement for the tower located at 169 Medill Church Road to report back to committee. And four, place in each future yearly budget a maintenance fee for all town communication towers if applicable. Schedule each of the town's communication towers for full inspection reviews based on the CSA's timeline and placed in the corresponding budget year. Okay, Ian, it's all yours. Thank you very much. My apologies for making you read that much of that, uh, that particular item. Just waiting on the presentation to come up. Perfect, thank you. So a little bit of background, there was a, a report that we brought forward last year uh, that was reviewing the, the towers and incorporating them into the IT department. So as part of that, we went through and we did an assessment of each of those towers, so physical assessment uh, to an outside party. Uh, that was to assess, obviously, repairs, whether they need to be replaced, ongoing use of that, uh, those towers, what's on them, and then uh, starting to prepare future use or things that came up. 
Out of that review, we had three major towers. We have uh, Port Sydney Tower, we have one at Medill Yard, and we have the one on Florence, uh, which is apparently slowly being renamed to something else, so I apologize, I'm out of date uh, as of a few minutes ago. Uh, so Port, <laughs> Port Sydney Tower, this is at the uh, fire hall. It's primarily used for radio communications for the fire hall, and it's also used for some data so that we can get our network data out to that building. The report came back, it's in good condition, it's relatively new, it was uh, constructed in around the 2008 window. They have some minor, minor repairs that we need to look at doing on that, uh, which we've identified in the photos, uh, where there's some bolts that were incorrectly put in, some grounding cables, some additional cables that just need to be tidied up uh, to get that one done. So our recommendation moving forward is obviously complete the maintenance to, to bring it up to specifications, and then just add it to our, our maintenance plan uh, that we have uh, proposed. The next item was at Medill Tower. So this is lo located on the Public Works Yard. It's currently used for Public Works to get their data for their network out there, as well as Lakeland has some clients also off that tower. Uh, unfortunately, the report came back on this one that it was in very poor condition, um, and it was recommended for replacement uh, and removal. And we've actually put a stop climb order on it so that nobody can access that particular tower because of that. There's issues around bolts, incorrect types of bolts, uh, incorrect torquing on the bolts, so it's actually uh, hurt the tower. Some of the main verticals have been crushed, unfortunately, with some of the antennas that put on there, so it's taken away their structural integrity. Um, and it would ultimately require whole sections that to be removed from that tower and actually be reinstalled. And then obviously the, the bigger problem here is it hasn't been properly sunk into the ground. There's a minimum requirement it has to go in. If that hasn't been done, it was, it was uh, sunk about a foot too short out of the three feet. So given all of those elements, it came back that replacement uh, or removal is the best available option here. So our recommendation is we work, out, work, work with Lakeland, see what our options are about potentially some sort of cost sharing or a payment plan to, to bring that back in, uh, into specification. And that's, uh, sorry, to replace that unit, but then help us to uh, pay for that cost going forward. The last tower we have is up on Flor Florence, which is the, we're discussing the large uh, tower, but it's not the bell tower that has the wide top, so you should be able to see that from everywhere. This is used for town data, so it is our central jumping off point from town office all the way out to public works. It goes out to Port Sydney. It deals with Summit Center, the libraries, the fire halls. Um, all of that flows through that for us. Uh, it also is a bridging point for the fire. Their voice leads from their building here in town up to that tower, and from there it gets down to Port Sydney uh, for their shortwave communications. Lakeland also has a number of devices on there uh, that they provide out for their clients, and that's the, the clients we have there. The report on that one, although the tower, uh, we were unable to establish exactly when it was built. We have a number of documents that show when there is approval for towers, and we have documents talking about towers that are there. Uh, we actually don't have a firm document that says when it was built, but it is in good condition as per the, uh, the, uh, the consultant. Uh, there are a number of items that need to be dealt with that are uh, critical, so things like guy wire tensioning needs to be done. Uh, it is under specification. There's some line clearing that needs to be done. There's one support member, which we've all laughed about, is how we damage the support at 140 feet in the air, uh, but there is one that's damaged that needs to be fixed. There's an anchor shackle that needs to be replaced on a couple of the items you can see in the picture there where it allows the top two, allow it to both horizontal and vertical movement. And you see on the bottom one, there is only horizontal movement, I apologize, uh, vertical movement allowed and no, no horizontal. So that work needs to be done. So the recommendation we have is, is go through, complete the repairs on this uh, tower to bring it back up to, to specifications. Uh, put it on our maintenance plan to make sure that we're getting out there and, and reviewing it. Engage Lakeland in, in establishing a contract. There's, a, there's an older contract in place right now, but uh, that needs to be refreshed. And then there was another item talking about uh, reviewing for land use. So we do have some costs to do that. So to bring up our, uh, the repairs, the repairs on the Port Sydney Tower were about $3,800 to bring that into alignment. The Florence Tower worked out to about $16,000, $16,500 uh, to get that work completed. We're recommending for this year uh, we're doing $500 per tower is the annual inspection. So this is a, a sort of a light inspection just to make sure there's no gross or significant problems. And that repeats every year so, uh, going forward. And then every four years, the guy wire tower needs a deep inspection. So that's where they do a full climb, verify the verticals, do the tension testing, all of those items. And then the f any freestanding towers 
we do every six years uh, is the, the requirements for that. And that works out to about $1,500 a tower on those particular years to get that work done. So those are the maintenance plans that we put them on. Uh, so, and then on the right, I've just noted any capital costs. So replacement of the towers that are freestanding, they're between 30 and $50,000 for a replacement. Uh, and the, the tower on Florence, uh, whether it's a guy wire, is about $150,000 for replacement. But if we switch over to a freestanding, you're, you're about the 250000 mark to get that work done. And then the last item we were looking at with the kind of spun out of this was looking at the placement of the tower up on Florence. Uh, it covers a fair amount of uh, land, but that is unfortunately right in the center of that piece of property. So there is a discussion to be had at some point uh, whether or not that land wishes wish you to use it for something else, whether attainable housing, uh, in which case we need to discuss how to deal with that tower. So I want to make you sure you're aware of that particular item because it's obviously important to the discussion of whether we spend money, um, whether it's money today, money tomorrow. Uh, we just need to be conscious of that possibility. And that was all that I had. Uh, if there's any questions that I may be able to answer for you. Absolutely. Uh, Deputy Mayor Armour and Mayor Alcock. Thanks, Chair Morrison. Um, through you, uh, just a quick question. The one on Florence Street, 40 Florence Street, we have property on the other side of Florence, Florence Street also. I'm just wondering, what would it cost to move that tower from that location across the street, or is that even feasible? It, it would, uh, sorry, through you, Chair Morrison. Uh, the answer is that anything's possible. It could be moved. We would just need to look at, um, at the uh, topographical to make sure we have the right kind of height. The other thing we would have to look at is we'd have to look at the uh, transportation rules on that. We do have some latitude, so you can, within an individual piece of property, there are rules on how much you can move a tower, how much you can raise a tower, lower it if you have to, uh, without having to go back through a whole uh, assessment process. I would just have to see if across the street would trigger that, because if we do that, then it, then you start back that whole process uh, to do all of your uh, NAVCAN uh, approvals and everything else to make that change. Within the property, we can most likely move it around on the property without a problem, without triggering that. Great question. Uh, Mayor Alcock? Uh, thank you. Um, through you, Chair Morrison, to Ian, a great report. And um, certainly the discussion around the Florence Street property, I'm glad that you had that special um, slide. And I thought I read in the report that, um, that in your discussions with Lakeland, who are currently using it, that you, there was potential maybe of having other users who might use that, that we might enter or consider entering into, which would be better for our revenue flow. To you, Chair Morrison, yes, so the answer is for sure. The goal would be to open that up, uh, that uh, location, and, and anybody who wishes to rent space on it would be certainly valuable to us uh, to help cover the costs. Obviously, it would be nice to get into a, a payment where we're getting enough money in that on its uh, 30 or 40 year cycles, we've collected enough money to at least pay for its replacement and, and maintenance along the way for sure. And a follow up, yes. If I may, thank you. Um, and great, uh, thank you for that answer. So I, I certainly um, support, support the report and doing the, the, the maintenance isn't you know, all that considerable given the, the cost of replacing it with a whole other tower and, and the potential negotiations. Um, and I think that with the possibility of, of some form of attainable housing on that site, it probably won't happen t tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So um, going forward with the proposed plan makes sense. But I certainly appreciate the, the comments and the report. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair Morrison. I, I may have missed this in the report. I read it a couple times. Can we look at the potential of locating on the commercial utility tower? To you, Chair Morrison. Uh, yes, the answer is we, we can. Uh, there's obviously nothing stopping us from doing that. Uh, they are usually fairly expensive to do and to engage, uh, certainly when I've looked in the past, uh, to be on the bell tower that's beside us. There's usually an, sorry, an engineering fees that we have to pay, structural designs we have to go through to get to that. Uh, and then it usually becomes fairly expensive. So from our standpoint, uh, the going rate is usually $500 per antenna uh, that we would put on there. And uh, for the town itself, we've got uh, six currently located on the Florence Tower. So there would be, uh, so there'd be some notable costs uh, to, to both get started as well as the ongoing expenses uh, to do that work. So it, it is absolutely possible, but uh, that's usually the limitation is, is dollars. So just to follow up, we 
we haven't confirmed any numbers or, and, and what that will actually look like. We have not reached out. I do not have firm numbers uh, to provide you that. Okay. Thank you. Back. Thank you, Councilor Vichero. Over to Councilor Remick. Thank you, Chair Morrison. And to, through you to Ian, you're, you're recommending or the, the report is recommending that the Medill Church Tower be decommissioned. Yeah. And is there any um, is there any recourse in? It sounds like it was it was put together very poorly. Like if bolts were put on incorrectly, using the wrong bolts, not to torqued to the to the right. Who? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any recourse? Like who who put that? Who built that? To you, Chair Morrison. Uh, the answer is I we don't have any documentation on who built that, uh, and we don't know where some of that work came from. Uh, so we'd, we'd have to get into that more, but I, I don't. we don't have any records of, of where that came from, unfortunately. We just know things like the struts, uh, we'd have to look to see who put that particular antenna on that, that crushed them, but uh, nonetheless, we're still at that point. So just, just to follow up, Chair Morrison, um, the cost to replace that particular tower you said was between forty dollars and $50,000, or is that the $100,000? That's... Uh, Morrison. The, uh, the vendor came back and uh, it's $50,000 to replace that tower. Okay. They on occasion and currently do have a one use tower that's only got two years worth of life in it. So that was available to us at $30,000. So it was a, a, that's where the lesser cost came from. And the rate is two years of life used, right? So you still have a remaining remaining expected life of... That would be another 20, 24 yeah. years or something. Yeah. So a significant savings for only a two year old. Yeah, it's like buying a used car. And Actually, speak to that. It seems like the from our meeting the other day. It seems like towers, tel telco towers, and cell towers are like the wild west. Uh, we don't know who put them up. We don't know when they were built. We don't really have a record of inspections and whatnot. So the work that Ian's doing right now is pretty critical. Like for instance, the Florence Street. We don't even know when that was put up. So it might be past its life expectancy already. Uh, it is past. Its it life. is past. They, yeah. they say for guide wires, it's a 40, 40 year window. Mm -hmm. So we know that from when we know when talk, people are talking about a tower up there. Uh, and uh, that's already past the 40-year window. So mm. the fact that it's inspected well and it's, it's good, then we can continue to operate it. But we, from a lifespan's perspective, we technically are past its, its window. Okay. Councillor Cloutier. In my line of business, I do do a lot of work on the towers. And there's umpteen different companies, like, and they change constantly. So I don't think you'd ever be able to find out or go back on or whatever. There's is quite a lot of companies that do it now. There's about two major ones that are going heavy right now, but there has been a lot in the last 10, 15 years in and out of the business. Councilor Remwick? So, Council Mor or, thank you, Councilor Morrison. Just a follow-up to that then. So if it's on our private if, or on town property and we have no record of who built it, no. like th so when we put a new one up, let's take really good notes, okay? <laughs> yeah. So for future councils, they can go, okay, we know. <laughs> thank you. Yes, that's... That's what Ian is doing now. Ian's fixing all the problems. Um, Claire Kalea. So just to give a little background, how this all started was um, um, Director McKenzie's department, um, their stellar uh, ability to tell us when we're missing things, um, asked us for um, some insurance paperwork on the towers as part of their due diligence. And um, so that kind of started our Ian and my ball rolling with trying to figure out the towers. And I could see in the minutes from the 60s, um, it noted that the MTO was looking at putting a tower up on the hill. <laughs> That's the kind of minutes you're reading and you're with, through all of that, you're piecing it together to get the picture. Um, but unfortunately, 1960, we just don't have uh, that stuff. So we can see it's probably around that time on Florence Street, but uh, that, that's the best we could uh, come up with. <laughs> and that's what Ian's dealing with right now. Um, any other questions? Okay, I've got a couple of quick questions, Ian. Um, can you need my glasses. So with the, I had the same question that Councillor Fitzgerald had as far as um, coordinating with Bell. Um, if we do go down the road of replacing, I know that, I don't know if I can say this in public, I don't think Bell's very good at playing in the sandbox with other telcos. I have a consultant we can recommend to them if they want to learn how to play in the sandbox, but the, um, as an aside, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble today. The, 
but I'm okay with that. So I guess the question is, has we, have we ever approached Bell about being on one of their towers? And we also have to consider the fact that we wouldn't want to leave Lakeland behind, right? We, Lakeland, we're a shareholder, we would want to take them with us. And would they be receptive to having Lakeland, one of their competitors, be on their tower with us? Um, having not spoken to them directly, yeah, I don't know for sure. Uh, my understanding is there's uh, there is rules that they are not allowed to decline anybody. Uh, and uh, but that being said, that doesn't mean they're not allowed to charge us uh, for that uh, for that uh, position. And when you mentioned five hundred dollars per, that's five hundred times uh, per month is what you're thinking. So it's six thousand a year times six is thirty six thousand dollars a year. Wouldn't take long for us to build our own build our own tower. Unfortunately, that does sometimes become the better option or mm -hmm. go to al alternative technologies. Okay, and making the business case that. Uh, Mayor Alcock discussed earlier, if we were to build our own tower and we were to have Lakeland pay 500 or thousand dollars, is, is 500 the going rate and we couldn't ask a thousand or is a thousand a month something we could think about? So uh, the going rate tends to be around the $500 mark per antenna is, is kind of the going rate. And that covers all the services. So that gets asked into the building, to power, uh, access to the tower, things like that. Okay, and with that, how many tenants, and maybe you're not there yet, but how many tenants would you think would be reasonable that we could recruit to the tower? Like, could we get three tenants up there? Oh, tenants themselves are, are not the problem. It's, it would just be uh, how many antennas it can do. It's, mm -hmm. it's all measured based on what's called the square footage, the face square footage of each individual antenna, and then the tower is rated for that. So it'll d that will define how much square footage we have. So you could have one big antenna on there, or you could have 20 smaller ones. Okay. It does uh, truly depend. Um, right, I'm just trying to make the business case for whether it makes sense to think about constructing one. And I, th if I think about three tenants at $500 per month, that's 6,000, that's 18,000 a year. On a $150,000 build out, we're looking at about a 12% return per year. It takes about six years to have a full refund of what we got into it, I'm, and that's quick math. It might make sense to to think about construction instead of spending the sixteen or seventeen thousand. If we think we can make a business case to get the money back from from leases on the building or on the tower. So yes, and, and one of the things we do have to consider with that, and, and that part comes into the whole discussion, is like a guy wire tower like we have right now. It, its capacity is significantly more four to four to five times the capacity it can take versus a freestanding tower. So. With the stuff that we have on the tower now, a freestanding has a potential to use, but we're not necessarily going to be able to get a lot more on that tower. The trade-off is that a freestanding tower will have a 20-foot square base on it, and that's it. So moving that on, on, on that property gives that whole property back. Uh, but if we want to if we want to go for maximizing uh, return, you're going to want to go with the guy wire tower, and that will limit the amount of space you have. Uh, for example, if you look at that last diagram, you can see uh, in it where the bell lines are. And if you kind of place that over where our tower is, that's the amount of square footage we're consuming as well on that. So uh, it would make that land not unusable, but uh, very challenging to use. Okay. All right, I like that. I, I really would love to explore Councillor Armour or Deputy Mayor Armour's idea of putting it across the road. Um, and I don't know, Ian, do you have the capacity to take that on right now? Is it something you can explore for us? Because if that's the case, that could be a really good answer for us. Yeah, we can, we can absolutely look at that. Uh, obviously, it's specialized, so I would probably have to reach out to somebody who's, who specializes in doing those types of things, but uh, that is distinct something we could take on, yes. And the last question, I promise, um, would we consider a monopine in that area, or would that be so high that it would look at a place? I didn't hear your question. Well, would we consider doing a monopine tower like that we try to get telcos to do? This is a 200 foot tower. I mean, I don't think there's anything we can do to make it not look like a tower. It would look like the craziest tree in the world. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we might be laughed at. Okay, any other questions on, on that? Okay, great. People are, oh, oh yeah, we're just getting close to lunch now. So with that, uh, I'll call the question. All in favor? That is carried, and it is lunchtime. It is officially 12.45, so we'll come back here at 1.15. One, is that good? 1.15, one fifteen. okay. Thank you.
Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting back to order at 116. Mayor Alcock, I'm not as expedient as you. I'm one minute behind. But uh, this is um, Julia McKenzie time for the next four hours. <laughs> we are, we are going to do uh, item 9.3.9 um, with Julia reporting on report number Corp 2023-13 credit card processing fee. And I do have a motion on this one. And I know that we're going to have some conversation on this one. Um, moved by Councillor Cloutier, seconded by Councillor Schumacher. It is recommended that committee approve charging a merchant surcharge fee of up to 2.4% on any payment to the town paid by credit card. And further that an amendment to the credit card, credit and debit card policy be presented to committee for consideration prior to implementation of a merchant surcharge or acceptance of credit card payments for property taxes or development charges. With that, I'll pass it over to Julia. Um, thank you, Chair Morrison. Um, so the town has had multiple requests to allow for credit card payments to be accepted for property taxes and development charges for pretty much as long as I've been employed here. The report before you is to have committee make a recommendation as to whether credit card surcharges should be applied for all credit card transactions um, that we accept and simultaneously also begin to accept credit cards for property taxes and development charges. So the significant challenge with accepting uh, credit for uh, property taxes and development charges is the fee associated with those, um, with those charges as they, as they generally are fairly significant. Um, as I noted in the report, we don't only collect uh, property taxes for the town, but we also um, accept it for the district and uh, education as well. Um, so if we were collecting or paying for, allowing for credit card charges, um, we would be paying the fees on those as well and not being able to pass those back to those um, organizations. Um, so even without accepting credit card payments for those two fees, we are over um, $100,000 right now in merchant fees. So if we are to accept credit card charges for all transaction um, to avoid a significant hit to the taxpayer, a merchant charge should be implemented at the same time. Um, I just wanted to note a few things in addition to the report. Um, the fees that I did list in the report are for the merchant rates only, and it is a bit confusing. I was looking at one of the one of our statements, and there's about 20 different fees that are associated with each um, with each month, so it is a bit confusing. So, in addition, there's also fees such as terminal fees. So those are um, the payments for the shopping cart kind of function um, that you would see online for, um, like, say, for Perfect Mind or Cloud Permit. Um, and other monthly and processing fees. So when I looked at last month's um, fees, um, it was around 3.3 overall for those transactions. Um, for places where we accept online payments, they would not have to only pay by credit card. They can also pay by uh, Visa debit or MasterCard debit, um, which would not be impacted by implementing the, the merchant surcharge. So um, some people weren't aware, but your um, debit card usually has a Visa or MasterCard logo on the bottom of it and you can usually use that online for payments um, to go through your bank. So in discussions with other Muskoka municipalities, there are some who already have um, been charging a convenience fee, which is different than the merchant fee or merchant surcharge of around 2.5, but only for limited transactions, online transactions. And only um, Muskoka Lakes take a payment uh, for property taxes by credit card, and they do take they do pay a fee through Moneris on that. We also allow for um, people to pay for property taxes online through credit card, but it's through a third party as well. And I believe it's around three percent that you would pay to. Um, it's a company called Plastique. So we've been asked also about um, the timing of this report. Um, and I just want to make note that it, it would be important that we look at this um, prior to the 2024 budget process. Um, this is a significant change in services and many resources would be required to implement this whole process. Um, it wouldn't be a quick flick the switch and it, we would start charging this. Um, we have many different merchant providers and we also have many software products that we use for our point of sale systems. Um, there's lead time um, that is a requirement, so when you decide that you're going to start charging this, you also have to give the public a certain amount of lead time to, uh, before you can do that, and you also have to have an education um, component um, in doing so. So even if we started mid-summer, we wouldn't know the impacts in the budget overall until such time that we would have a history um, to support these estimates. 
And as noted, the 2.4 would likely not cover the full amounts of the fees. Um, as I said, right now, that's about 3.3. We also need to consult with merchant providers to determine their capabilities as they're working through these changes um, in the credit card industry. And again, it was in the report just a, as a result of the whole class action lawsuit that was settled last year. Um, we also need to work with our software providers as well um, as they don't, most of them don't currently have this function. Um, when I did talk to Moneris, they, they currently don't have this function. So they are, it is something that they're working on. I'd also like to provide a short overview of the issues that arise with the billing department. Um, right now, they've moved mainly to an online system for um, building permits, and there are some challenges with accepting payments for the building fees. Um, as our merchant providers can't distinguish between the types of transactions to restrict the fees, so we can't say that they can go online and they can pay debit for one transaction and um, visa for the other. So for example, um, a customer um, could pay the building permit fee online, but then they would need to physically come into the office um, to pay for the development charges. So this report's before you for consideration. Thank you, Julia, and I'm sure we're gonna have uh, some, some dialogue on this. Anybody would like to speak to this or any questions? Council Clark. Thank you, Chair Morrison. So I'll start, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> I have to be honest, when I saw the report read through it, my first reaction would be that it'd be a pretty easy decision on this to support the surcharge. Um, it'd be a way to lower our operating costs, and we all know it costs a lot of money to process credit card payments. I know from my own business that it costs me a lot of money every year to, uh, to process payments. Um, I, so the only way we could really even consider expanding what could be paid by credit cards at the town would be, I, I think, would be to, to put a surcharge in place. Um, as of today, I, I received feedback from 42 individuals that gave me their opinion on what they thought about a surcharge. So I have to say I was a little bit surprised by um, the answer. So. 38% were in favor of a surcharge. 62% stated uh, they didn't want to pay a surcharge and wanted the town to continue to cover those charges. So I was surprised by that, to be honest with you. And so for me, it makes um, the decision a little bit harder to make. Um, it, if we did pass the item today, it's important to keep in mind, I think uh, the average credit card processed by the town was $106, about that. So the surcharge would be $2.55 on, on $106. Of course, some purchases will be more, some would be less. And if somebody didn't want to pay a surcharge, they could pay online with debit visa or in person, as Julia mentioned. Um, my concern is that we've already budgeted the funds for 20, 2023 to cover the credit card charges. So we're talking about changing something that we've already budgeted for which is the same scenario that we went through with Burnell Locks to some degree, which could reflect poor, poorly on council. Um, also, um, in the federal budget that was released yesterday, uh, it was stated that the government struck a deal with major credit card companies that could potentially see fees reduced up to 27% for about 90% of businesses that take credit cards. So, I don't know if that would apply to the town of Huntsville, but it's definitely we need to look into that. And so I feel it's maybe yet another reason to maybe consider postponing the motion to look look more into some more information in regards to that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Stone. Thank you. Um, it, it makes a whole lot of sense to actually be charging this fee simply because <clears throat> When I buy things on my credit card, I know I get points so that I can travel or get money back or whatever it, whatever it is. Um, so right now, the taxpayer is paying for other people to get their points on their credit card. And that doesn't seem right to me. Um, as a retailer, um, these charges, I didn't want my customer to see that I was charging for the 2.4% on any given item. So I ultimately increased the price of the product to cover that expense. Um, 
but we can't really do that. Um, the, the one thing, it would be wonderful to have a mechanism that people can go online to pay for their swimming lessons or whatever, whatever it might be uh, electronically rather than having to come in. <clears throat> so can you tell me, can we use e-transfer? Um, so just to answer, or make a point to your first uh, comment there. So we do have a mechanism that you can go online and pay for all of your swimming lessons, that sort of thing. It's all done through uh, Perfect Minds. So you can go on and pay by debit, debit visa, MasterCard visa, or credit cards. So that's currently is available. Um, we work really hard with our bank on fraud mitigation, um, just to make sure that, that all of our transactions are secure. And I would recommend that e-transfers are not a secure way to uh, to conduct business with the town. We have so many different um, point of sale spots and just even the manual, the manual time it would take to track down transactions um, would be significant just because of the amount of transactions that we actually take, that we do take. So with, with e-transfers, I, I should note that you can actually go online or to any bank and pay for your um, property taxes right now. So that is something that you can do electronically. So there is electronic ways of making most payments. But not, not for the little things. <coughs> not for the, the little payments. Um, so absolutely, there's, we have a lot of online forms now. A lot of our services, so you can buy bag tags online or garbage tags online. You can do all of your um, dog tags online, swimming lessons, pretty much anything um, we have an online form for. And you can pay by credit card that way. With using a credit yeah, card. Yeah, or debit card, debit visa. Yeah, and before we move forward, I'll just, I think as a, as a point, the reason this is coming up now is that we're trying to advance our services by offering credit card payments for development charges and property taxes. So we're okay with the fact that people can pay for their swimming lessons with a credit card. It is not a, we budget it for, it's a hundred and some odd thousand dollars a year. What we're saying is if we're gonna allow credit cards for development charges and property taxes, now all of a sudden it's significant. You know, so that's, that's where we're, I think we're going at. Mayor Alcock and then Councilor Remwick. Thank you, Chair Morrison. It's along the lines, I think, of um, what yeah, Councillor Stone, although I, I, I'm supportive of this, I, um, I think that 107000 um, that we currently spend is, is significant, and to your point, Chair Morrison, it will be a whole lot more if we offer this service. And I, the, one of the reasons why um, I am supportive is if you don't want to use a credit card, you don't have to, right? I mean, I, you can, as you said, it might not be as secure, but you can pay your property taxes uh, with e-transfer, and you can pay for your swimming lessons or the use of the pool or any of those other things. You can do the old-fashioned write a check, right? So if you don't want to use a credit card, you don't have to. If I felt like that was the only way, and then we're charging it, then I, would, I, I wouldn't feel as, as positive about this. Okay, and Sorry, Clay, I, I would like to... Hang on a sec. Um, we are having a technical issue with the live stream for a moment, so we need to just stop for a second yep. and just restart the meeting, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep.
Okay, we'll reconvene after our technical glitch there. Uh, and I believe where we were, we were at the discussion and it was uh, Councillor Renwick's turn and then we have um, Chris, Na Manager Nagy to, to speak. Thank you, Chair Morrison. Um, I guess my question, and it, it does relate to what uh, Councillor Clark said about having um, some sober second thoughts or thinking about it, because initially I thought to myself too that this is a good thing that we should be charging it. But then after I thought about it, I thought, if, if there's a young family coming with um, a mother you know, registering her children for swimming lessons and we're charging an extra surcharge on top of what she's paying, it's like the cost of doing business for us. And I, I would have a hard time explaining that to the public that we're paying, or we're charging extra for you to take a lesson at the town or... And so I, I'm hesitant to increase or to, to allow this surcharge to go through. Um, but on the other hand, I also see that this $100,000 that we're spending every year. <clears throat> so my, my point is, I think um, I would agree with Councillor Clark that we may defer this until next year. And it looks like there's a lot of things that have to come into place anyway. So, so more of a comment than a question. Okay, thank you, Councillor Remick. Um, Manager Nagy, do you want to speak now or do you want to let Deputy Armour speak first? Okay, Deputy Armour, Deputy Mayor Armour. Thanks, Chair Morrison. Just a quick question. I'm not sure, Julie, how long did you say it would take before this would actually come into effect? Was it like months from now? Um, I don't have a firm timeline. I'd have to go back um, and go through the whole process to see what needs to get done. Currently, some of our software providers don't have the capacity right now, so we'd have to work with them to get that capacity. As I said, Moneris doesn't have the capacity to, do, to, to make that distinction right now. Um, so we do have to work through that and then we also have to, so we have to we would have to work with you know we've got cloud permit we've got um, uh, perfect mind we've got um, some other software providers that we would have to work with to come up with the process and then also to come up with the education um, we'd also have to bring back the credit and debit charge policy too as well um, just to incorporate all those changes for council to consider as well so follow up to do so in reality, if we were to pass this today, it could actually take eight months. So it wouldn't even come into effect till 2024. Yes, I couldn't imagine it being a quick turnaround. I, it would take at least six months or more to do it. Right, okay, thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor Armour and Councillor Cloutier. Through you, Chair. Um, are we being asked by our customers uh, like the for the building permits and the big ticket items are we being asked to provide a credit card service for them or is this something that we've decided that we're going to offer them at this time um so we are asked um a lot at the counter about, about accepting credit cards for um uh, for property tax payments because people will come in and they want to pay their property taxes by credit cards so we do get asked that question but i will um, pass it over to uh chris nagy who will speak to the building charges. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, yeah, with respect to the building permit fees, we do um, get, get question on that. One thing for clarity, and this kind of came more evident over COVID and things like that, um, through our permitting system right now, we do all of our um, uh, receipts and invoices and everything like that. There is an ability to um, push it to a online payment source so that people can simply just pay right through that program and everything. So that kind of sparked this whole conversation. Um, right now, uh, people can come in and can go through the counter and over COVID we were accepting credit cards for building permits. Um, the kind of big ticket item being the development charges um, is in some cases minute in comparison to the building permit fees in that, you know, I have an individual that's coming in with, let's say a rural application at $12,000 in, in uh, development charges, which is very high, but the building permit fee that they're putting on their credit card is 25,000, right? So we're paying the, whether it's at the counter or online, we're paying that penalty anyway, right? So um, that was kind of my argument of if we do everything online, then at least as they're going through the process, they're doing a one portal, one payment, and, and everything's done in that realm. However, there's also the cost of development charges last year. Um, I can't remember exactly the number, but I know it was 
over you know two hundred thousand dollars at the very least in development fees, right? So that two point five is significant if you're covering it off with uh, um, with credit cards for sure. So, yeah. Thank you, Chris. And over to Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you through you, Chair Morrison. So yes, there are options. If people want to buy tickets, they can go to, we've now increased hours, people can go and buy tickets in, with cash, correct? And uh, all those other options. If we did pass this today, could we set a timeline to say not to uh, institute it until such a time and then it goes into say next year's budget or at that point when we, we can do that? Okay. Thank you. Councilor Remick. Thank you, Chair Morrison. The more I think about it, the more I think if, when it comes to development charges and paying your taxes, that is a huge amount of money, and I agree that there should be an option to play, pay for it, but I really have a hard time agreeing to ch ch uh, charging a surcharge on swimming lessons or anything like active activity lessons that we have, art lessons, whatever. That's, and I think that's what the 62% of the people have said they don't want that to happen. I think we have to listen to them as well. So maybe we're talking about two different things. One is services that we provide through the town for regular people, and then there are paying taxes and development charges. Uh, go ahead. Um, so I can see where it might get a bit confusing to the customers when, say, for example, they come to town hall and they buy, um, they want to pay for their, their bag tags and their some other miscellaneous items, and we don't charge a fee on that, and then we have to go, okay, now we have to stop, and then we have to do a separate fee, and we'd probably, I don't know how we would, we'd have to figure out how we could actually do that, because it would have to be two separate transactions, and we'd have to make sure our software was able to do that. So it, it might be tricky in that, in that sense. Um, if I could speak that quickly, Julie, is there a way to do it <coughs> on a minimum transaction? So if anything under $500 is not subject to the fee and anything over $500 would be subject to the fee? Is that a possibility? Um, it's my understanding that um, that you're not allowed to do that under um, under the, I don't know what the, the act is, but with the with the credit card agreement, so I don't believe that you can pick and choose when what level you can do that. I think they were challenged on that quite a few years ago. Yeah, I know at one point you weren't even allowed to, you weren't even allowed to give a discount to people for paying with cash or you'd lose the right to be a merchant, right, with Visa and, and whatnot. Um, Deputy Mayor Armour, I believe you had your hand up? Or it was Monty, uh, Councilor Cloutier. Thank you. Um, is Bracebridge doing this or any other big cities, uh, other municipalities that are comparable to us, are they doing this? Um, I, I couldn't find any specific examples. Um, this did just, this, this class action lawsuit did just get passed and this ability was just given um, to merchants I think in the fall of 22. So it's a, it's a, new, a new thing. Um, I did check um, Bracebridge has a, a convenience fee for online payments, which is different. So you can charge a convenience fee if it's an online payment. Um, but, they, but they don't, they still don't do it for, um, for development charges or for property taxes, it would be—it's more for cemetery, short-term rental, those kinds of fees. Um, Gravenhurst does have the same; it's an online uh, surcharge, but they don't take credit card payments as well for um, the same property taxes or development charges. Um, Georgian Bay is moving to um, more online for property taxes and all their services, so they've just started, and I think they're looking at a 2.5 convenience fee for online payments. Um, Muskoka Lakes also has the same thing, and their fee just actually goes right to payment. So it, it, they didn't want to even collect anything. There's just a fee that's charged to the customer, and, it, and it's passed along. Okay, so on that, Julie, on that 2.5% convenience fees for online payments, that's whether it's debit or credit card, I assume. It's just an online payment they're charging, regardless. I believe so, yeah. Okay, okay. Councillor Fitzgerald? Um, thank you, Chair Morrison. I, I think this is the new reality. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, if people want to bring a check in, they're more than welcome to bring a check in. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the rest of the taxpayers should be burdened to pay for people's choice of the use of credit card for whatever reason. So, you know, we're, we're, we're balking about giving back $3,000. Now we're concerned about the reaction of $100,000. So let's think about this clearly and 
this is the way it's gonna be in the future and it, there are options for people not to use their credit card. So let them exercise that if they don't wanna pay the fee. Yeah, and I'll speak to that and then I'll quickly pass it off to Director McKenzie. I'm with Bob, like if I go into a small business in town, I don't use my credit card. I know even restaurants, their margins are sometimes eight to 10%. So me using a credit card at 3.3%, that's 30% of their profit. So consider that when you're using a credit card in a small business. If I'm at Costco, sure as heck I'm using that credit card, I want my points. But I think the reality is for two things. One, um, Chris Nagy will tell you that just the time spent at the counter alone um, by us not offering the convenience of being able to pay with a credit card is taking staff time. I think for us to be efficient and professional, I think it's a service we need to offer. I think get, getting with the times. But I'm, I'm with Bob and Helena. Both your points kind of tailor together because your point is we're not, we shouldn't be funding points systems. And your point about um, single mom, single dads trying to pay for swimming lessons shouldn't be penalized. So I'd like to know that if we go forward that they have options. Because when you go online and there's a frenzy of trying to get that certain swimming lesson, um, you can pay with debit, thankfully. Um, but I don't know if we know, we just want to make sure there are other options for those folks. But I think we have to, we have to move forward with this. 100,000, and if it goes, if we go forward, it's probably going to be a lot more than that. 200,000 is one point on the levy, right? So it's a, it's a significant thing. And I'll pass it over to you. Sorry, one thing I just want to clarify. Um, I, I know we talked about accepting e-transfers, and we don't currently accept e-transfers. E-transfer is when you, you would send an email through your bank, um, and that's the Interact e-transfer. We don't currently accept that, because what would happen is an email would just get sent somewhere and then we would have to track down what that transaction belonged to and it's not secure because people can accept that and accept it into their banks. So we do not accept e-transfers. Um, but we do accept online payments. So um, for example, when you go on to, um, to register yourself, your child for swimming lessons, that sort of thing, you go on, there's a cart, it's for a specific item, you put in your credit, your debit, MasterCard or Mas debit visa um, or, or MasterCard and then um, it pays for that specific item. So there's just, I just wanted to make that distinguish between the two. Okay, and if somebody doesn't have a debit visa, then the only option would be a credit card, right? Um, so people can come in and pay um, with cash or they mm -hmm. can pay okay. by... Um, but online though, online, online. would just They would have to have a debit card or a, a, a visa debit card. visa, okay. Or, or a MasterCard. Okay, Mayor Alcock? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, uh, Chair Morrison, and thank you, Julia, for that, because I, I, I know I pay my taxes online. It's not e-transfer, but online, and it's a great, I, I love being able to do that. Um, and I agree with you, uh, Councillor Renwick, if, if this was the only thing, uh, the way that a mother with two kids could get her kids into swimming classes through credit card, I wouldn't be as comfortable with it, but it's not. There, there is another way. Right, so I, I, to me, I think we're not penalizing that mom if she really doesn't want to pay that way. So I, I, I really support this. I think this makes sense. Councilor Schumacher. So, and those people who pay their taxes through direct deposit on a monthly basis, this doesn't affect them either. Okay, I believe I had Councilor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, a quick comment uh, on some of the things I said earlier. So. Also, uh, less than 40% uh, of the people I spoke to would, said they would use uh, credit cards to pay for their property taxes and, and the same for development charges. So there didn't seem to be a lot of interest from people to pay um, property tax or development charges by visa from the people I spoke to. Uh, almost everybody that I talked to uh, used either the theater or the summit center or both. Thank you, Councilor Clark. And Chris, can you speak, you're in the trenches, can you speak to a typical day at the desk or a week at the desk and the number of requests you get and, and how important you think it might be? For sure. Um, so it does uh, speak to what Councilor Stone had brought up about points and things like that. And, you know, I don't think we're naive in that a lot of, you know, contractors do use something that could benefit from that. Um, but, you know, essentially uh, directly and, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to, kind of be biased in this, but the whole reason for going online and doing an online portal with building permits and everything is to reduce that, you know, um, traffic at that desk, right? And what I'm getting from my particular um, applicants are they're going through the whole process, they're getting everything, we issue out the invoice, and then they have to come into the, uh, into the town. So, you know, 
we have been directly, um, or I have chatted with um, uh, contractors directly on this. You know, there may be a fee associated with this, and they said, well, you know, I've got six other projects on the go, and if at nine o'clock at night I can pay this when I'm at home on my couch, as opposed to rearranging my day to come in and drop a check off to you, I have no problem with that, right? So, so that's the message we're getting. Again, that's that's more with the um, uh, development charges as opposed to the tax aspect. Um, however, uh, you know we're still over the phone taking those payments and, and things like that, right? So, so that's the message we're getting. So, yeah. that's great information, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions around the table, Councilor Schumacher? I guess, yes, if we go through with this, are we anticipating more traffic now, at, like less for you guys, but more at our customer service desks for then people coming in that don't want to, to Councillor Clark's point, go online to buy their tickets for theater or Summit Center? Um, yeah, we actually did have this discussion already with uh, Councillor Clark. Um, I don't know how um, people will behave it, it, I, I don't know the answer to that. That's why I couldn't tell you what the budget impact of this will be because some people may choose to come in and do the transactions, but again, they still have the option to pay by debit and a lot, most of our transactions are through cards rather than um, through, uh, through cash transactions. We don't actually accept cash or uh, checks for every transaction. We only do it when there's some sort of an agreement that's in place that we can easily go back to them on. Um, so yeah. But mo most are most are through card payments. Councillor Remick. Thank you. Just one more question or, or comment. The, um, I believe with tickets now for the Algonquin Theatre, you do get paid. You do get charged um, two point five percent, and it's with, within the, the the charge of the ticket. So they're used to that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do have it in the report that if if this was to go forward, we would be looking at that and aligning it so it's not duplicating that, we would be taking that out and having just one straight charge so, so that we're not double, double counting. Okay, Councillor Cloutier. Thank you, Chair. If, if we go ahead with this, I would like to see a set date for it, um, like, you know, not being able to accept credit cards for building permits and everything, keep going the way we are, keep our status quo, and then maybe 1st of December or when we're hitting that into the new budget that it be implemented then because if there's, it's going to take six months to get in, we don't want to pass this next January in the new budget and take six months to apply. So if we can set up, have enough time to set up our vendors from now until whenever and then we can start implementing it first of December, say, to start into the new year. We budgeted our 107000 for our cost now, and that's the cost of doing business that we've all agreed on a month ago. And But if we implement this, we have a start date for it rather than, okay, we're putting it in right away, and it might be ready in July, might be ready in September. I'd like to see a start date if this is implemented. Thank you. I think that ties into the, the timing that Director McKenzie mentioned that it's going to take ties into Councillor Clark's wishes that we kind of move it towards the next budget. What I would suggest is if we do move forward, I want to see a specific uh, education and information piece to go to the public. Uh, I want everyone to be aware that uh, they're going to have these charges and to let them know about all of the alternatives they can use so that people can avoid those charges if they want. Um, any other questions on this? Okay. Thank you, Chair Morrison. Um, I'm just confirming with Councillor Clark that he does no longer want a motion to postpone this matter on the floor. Thank you, Tanya. I think I would still like to put it out there because I, I have concerns about the changes that the government's proposing for what the rates are going to be. So we're proposing in this a 2.4%. It could it could be very well less than that, uh, based on the budget from yesterday yesterday for the 2023 federal budget. I think I'd still like to move that we defer the item uh, to a future meeting so that staff can get answers as to, far, as, as to how the budget will affect the, uh, the percent rates for credit card charges. Um, the other thing is, I think it would also allow us time to get more feedback from people, uh, from the public once they've seen the general committee meeting. Uh, 
to reach out to their counselors, talk about it some more, um, rather than just um, proving something quickly without getting a lot of feedback from the public. Okay, thank you, Councillor Clark, Councillor Councillor Stone. Uh, just in response to that, I, I am happy to move forward with this today. And uh, to your point, uh, the motion says up to 2.4%. Mm -hmm. So it, within the next six months, we will know exactly what uh, the industry is doing in this respect, and Julia can make the adjustment appropriately. Yeah, I tend to agree with Bob on that, because even if they do reduce by 27%, we're still, we can charge a maximum of 2.4, but the true cost to the town is 3.3. So we're not actually charging our true cost. So if it, if the federal government's budget brings it down by up to 27, maybe it's 20%, we still are probably in the 2.2 to 2.4% of our f cost anyway, right? Most likely. Yeah, I can't give you an exact percentage because it is based on the type of transactions that mm. happen each month, but it could, I have seen um, on some reports where the, the fees could be between like three to 6%. So I, I don't know the exact, so we, six, sorry, yeah. Three to um, six, right? Three to six, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Julie. Councillor Schubert and then Mayor Alcock. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so yes, and I think further to Councillor Cloutier, and that was the point I brought up, if we can set a date, I don't know if that has to be added as an amendment that it set. Do we have to say January 1 or December 1 within this, or does it give enough leeway to... I think that's a question for Julie. As far as the budgeting process goes, if you could pick a date ideal for your operations, what would you choose if it's a date in the future? Um, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I still, when we put this into place, it will take some time to get accurate numbers of what we would project for a budget figure because we, as Councillor Schumacher noted, we, we have to figure out what consumer behavior is before and what, what the fees are going to be. So it's not, it's not a we'd have to have a bit of time to look at that. So we wouldn't just be slashing the budget by $100,000 in 2024. We'd, we'd need a bit of time to make sure we're looking at accurate numbers for that. Um, I guess if it did occur on Jan on December 1st or if it was January 1st, um, that would probably be reasonable, but I'll let our clerk. Okay, Daniel. Thank you, Chair Morrison. I, I think because the director is, is basically saying she's not sure and also she has to deal with vendors and we don't know what they're gonna be like. It's, I, I would hate to put something in here and, and it be an issue and have to come back. So I think the director has heard the desire um, if it does go through today to get uh, it through urgency, um, but I kind of think I wouldn't put that in there and peg just in case. Um, I would note as well that, that part of this before we do anything is to bring back the policy before we could proceed. So it, it's kind of a second step that we would need to take anyway. So at that point, if, um, if, if there was a desire to hold off until implementing the policy, that could certainly be done at that time as well when we have more information. Okay, I, I like that because by that point, we'll know what the effect of the federal government is. We'll know a whole lot more information than we can set the date at that time. I believe if, uh, Mayor Alcock was next. Uh, thank you, Chair Morrison. I can be really brief because I, I really like what you just said, Julia, that, you know, the policy's coming back, and I was going to echo what Councillor Stone said. It sort of is in line with what you said, Bob, that, you know, it's going to take a while, and then we'll know what the impact of the federal budget is, and all of that will roll into um, the policy that will come back to us. And so um, I'm supportive of proceeding. Okay. Councillor Schumacher, and then I believe Councillor Clark. Thank you, uh, through you, Chair Morrison. Yeah, I'm totally in agreement now. I mean, I think my whole point about a date was that you weren't implementing it in like three months. We want some time, obviously, and so now with you bringing back the policy, I think that gives us the opportunities we need. Okay, now, Councillor Clark, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. I, I think that's good, and I, I really would like to be able to get some more feedback from the public on it, too. I think that's really important. I mean, uh, I think we need to be transparent about things with the public, and I know lots of people I, I speak to um, would like to see that from our council. I think that's very important that we do that. I agree, I think it's great, and I think I don't think there's any more questions, so a conclusion for me is that I think it's a service we do wanna offer. We wanna support uh, Chris and his operations, but I wouldn't want to offer the development charges and whatnot without charging the fee. 
So I think um, that's the path we're going. We'll circle back when Julia has everything done, but is there any other questions at the moment? I'll call the question. Uh, are we putting forward your amendment or are we? Thank you, Chair. Are we gonna go with that motion but, and tie it back to an earlier date? We had talked about July. We could shorten that if, depending on what you wanted to bring back as far as the time. I, I think the fact that Director McKenzie is bringing it back that is coming back. I think at that point, we can make sure you and I will be privy because we'll have an advanced meeting with Director McKenzie. You and I can be heavily involved in setting timelines and, and policy. Correct, right, Julia? Okay, what what so, do you think of that? So just to follow up, so are we, today we're just approving a, uh, for it to come back and have a look at? We're not actually approving. Uh, today the motion is basically giving her the ability, giving their department the ability to move forward with this plan, but it, it needs to come back to council for final approval after more information. Okay. Is that correct? Don't want to speak out of turn. I think that's where we're at, right? Okay. Um, and with that, I'd like to, like this discussion was excellent because it was a lot of balancing the needs of the corporation with the needs of the public and kind of tying those together to what's best for everybody. So great conversation. Um, with that, I'm gonna call for the question. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. Okay, moving right along to 9.3.10. Uh, Director McKenzie will speak to report number Corp 2023-14, the 2022 Treasurer Statement on Development Charges. This is for information only. Um, so it is interesting timing because everybody was asking about how much we have collected in development charges. So in 2022, uh, this is the most I've ever seen collected in development charges. We've collected 1.4 uh, million uh, over the year. In 2021, it was um, just under a million. It was nine point or 922,000. So um, it is pretty significant. So that hopefully will come into new taxation revenue at some point. Any comments or questions on this report? Mayor Alcock. Um, I thank you, Chair Morrison and Julia. I apologize. I, did, I was looking at this last night, and um, we collected a lot, and it was great. I, um, I was trying to find uh, how much we took out of our, our reserve uh, towards and put towards other projects. I think it was there, but I, I, I'm, I should have been more prepared for this. Go ahead. Um, Thank you. So um, overall, we took out um, eight hundred, or sorry, four hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars. So of that was the Hain Street streetlights for three hundred thousand. Uh, we also budget for library materials for a new growth of about forty-six hundred, and then we also have um, debenture payments for Forbes Hill and for um, the Canada Summit Center that we also take out annually. Could I follow up? Follow up, yes. Thank you. So um, the closing balance, December 31st, 2022, is over four million. And are those debenture payments coming out of that four million? So, or are we looking at a really healthy surplus in that? That's what, sort of what I'm thinking. Um, sorry, that, that is the ending balance. That's after we took out the amount of for the so debenture that payments. that is what we have in there. Yeah, but we do, we will be um, continuing to take out those debenture payments annually. Right, but generally it's fairly, I guess what I'm getting at, that we should be looking at this fund for other projects at the moment because just as a rule. That's right, and um, also just during the 2023 budget, we did include, and sorry, I don't have them off the top of my head, um, several projects for the dev development charges Good. to start okay. using those funds. Good, all right, okay, thanks. That's a great comment, Mayor Alcock. And speaking, thinking of Bob's committee, we're looking at the sidewalk master plan and how development charges have to be used for stuff like that, right? So if we're in a really good position, that bodes well for what you might be able to pull off, right? Which is great. And <laughs> um, back to Director McKenzie. Um, 
I, I would just note that um, that we do have the development charge background study on our website, and it is a good tool because it does show all the um, projects that we have included in our DC study. So those are the projects that we can use um, for development charges, and there and there are several. Um, there's trails projects in there. There's uh, um, sidewalk projects, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a good tool to look at to see what was included. Okay, back to Mayor Alcock. Um, just one quick question, our DC study, when is the next update? Um, fortunately for us, it's gonna be for 2024. So it is something that we are gonna put out for um, tender um, with the other municipalities in Muskoka, other than the district in 2023. So soonish, mm -hmm. soonish. So that's important to be, okay, thanks. And last question on that, is there a number you like to see it not go below? Is there a number you wanna see in that account? Um, it's it's not the same as um, it's not the same as our general reserves. Uh, we we collect the funds um, based on the study for um, capital that we've identified. So you should be spending the money that are in these funds for those those purposes. We have to remember that we only collect um, the DCs at. I want to say it's 42%. I'm trying to remember the number, but we don't collect it at 100%. So for the projects that we have included in there, we don't have the full amount of funding. So that's where we have some difficulty because if, say, if we have a sidewalk project, we can only fund it 50%. Um, the rest of it has to come through taxation. Okay, so you couldn't simply take an extra 500,000 and put it into roads for Monty and Jason to take care of. Right? It has to be a specific project. Okay. Um, Councillor Remick. Uh, thank you, Chair Morrison. So are we saying that that $4 million is not the full amount that's actually in there? It's only, like, there could be more money in there because we haven't charged all of the... Yeah, and I apologize. So if, if we yeah. had charged it at the full rate, it would have been much higher than that. Wow. Yeah, okay. Councillor Fitzgerald. Thanks, Chair Morrison. I'm wondering if you should explain the, the, the reduction in, in development charges for some people. And, and I'll assure you, we'll all have a good lesson on development charges over the next year because we have a lot of meetings that are required for the background study. Um, and as well, the district will, is already going through that process right now. They've already, I think, they picked their consultant for that. Um, so when, when we, we come up with um, what capital that we need and we come up with what the, what the allowable DC rate is, um, or what the charge is, that gives us the charge for each kind of property, um, council at that point actually decided to only implement it at, and I think it was 42.5%, but I believe our clerk's helping me find that number, maybe. And I believe that for industrial, it was actually a lot lower. I think it was like at maybe 10% of what we could have been charging. Um, so when you're looking at a project, you can only use that money for a growth related project and only up to the amount that you've collected the funds. So if the project is, you know, say a million dollars and only half of it relates to growth, you can only use 50% of that. And then if you only collected 42.5%, you can only use 42.5% 40, of that 50%. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit complicated, but yeah, you have to, you can't just pull money out and use it um, for projects. It has to be growth related and it has to be up to the percentage that you've collected. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go to Jason for a follow-up and then Mayor Alcock. I, I'm just gonna add in some layman terms there. Um, no, very few municipalities, if any, I don't, think it's ever been done, charge full rate of, of development charges. So it's like we're rebating the developers right at the beginning. And I think it, it was done to spur development. We used to have um, development charges waived for um, empty buildings and new buildings and that were never used or didn't get leased out. and we remove that one, I think, and that was ta regular taxes too on vacant buildings, right? So it was, it's just to incentivize development. I don't know why everyone just doesn't set the rates what they're supposed to be and charge those rates, but it's the games we play. Mayor Alcock. I can be very fast. Uh, thank you, Chair Morrison. I, um, Councillor Fitzgerald just said what, what 
I was going to say that every time we have this discussion and we do a development charge study, all of a sudden, at, certainly at district, there's a parade of, of developers that will come in and do presentations to talk about why it is we shouldn't be charging the full amount of what we are entitled to charge um, because they will say that we're trying to kill the industry um, by charging the full amount. So that, that happens every time and there's always a healthy discussion around every table. This table there will be and, and there always is at the district. And then the, you look at the comparisons between what we do here in Muskoka versus what they do in the GTA and that comes up. Staff certainly always presents that side too because the, the rates down there are unbelievably really high. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so we can move forward to 9.3.11, uh, regarding report number Corp 2023-16, insurance coverage, external policy update. I do have a motion moved by Mayor Alcock, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald. It is recommended that committee approves the changes to insurance coverage, external policy, Number insurance and risk-03 and repeals and replaces it as attached to report corp-2023-16. Director McKenzie. Thank you. So we brought forward this um, policy back in um, 2017, or sorry, not 2017, 2015, I believe. Um, and it's really used as a tool. Um, staff really rely on this so that we can provide guidance. It's hard to come up with all these insurance requirements, so we work with our insurance broker to come up with specific wording. Um, it doesn't always apply, and sometimes we have to make some um, decisions, which this policy does allow, but it does definitely give us um, a lot of guidance. Um, we did a big reformat just with our insurance broker, just on some wording, just to make sure we've got up-to-date kind of uh, language in there. Um, but the biggest um, change that we made um, is with respect um, to the special events, and those are in section uh, 3.9. So as we discussed earlier, we took those out of the special events bylaw, and we put them in here so all of our insurance requirements are in one spot. And we really did focus on looking at the different types of hosts to events too because it does change what the requirements are and we've had a lot of uh, learning over the past um, little while as people have gotten events back up and running. Um, events that are hosted externally by a, a different party or you know, organization or even the Chamber of Commerce um, is different than if the town hosts the event. And also, um, we also included one for the BIA as well because um, as you guys are aware, the BIA is covered uh, through our insurance policy. So if the BIA is doing something, we need to treat it with the same respect as we would a town event because that is our policy and anything that happens there will impact our premiums and deductibles. So we're, we're very um, cautious about that. And I think that was the main. Any questions? Mayor Alcock and then Councillor Stone. Uh, thank you, Chair Morrison, and thanks, Julia. A, a very quick question, and it's about the last point. So I looked at the last chart and specifically the reference to artists, painting, dancing, performers, etc., required only if there is significant financial risk to the municipality. So do I assume from that that probably not required? I mean, assuming, let's say, Councillor Renwick is doing um, a, an art class in Partners Hall or something, that likely there isn't a huge risk to the municipality. It's dangerous work. Mm -hmm. Director McKenzie? So I do need to look at the specific circumstances to answer that fully. Um, but yeah, if we did have somebody that was just doing a painting in the park, that's a lot different than if we have a painter that wants to have a whole series of um, like a big event, that kind of thing, that's where it would be different. But we, we do look at each, everything is very specific to the circumstance. So somebody throwing knives on a unicycle might be different than <laughs> Councillor Renwick painting. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Uh, Councillor Stone. Thank you. Um, so not directly to what's on the table here, but insurance in general, crazy expensive. And I've seen um, in the council correspondence, other municipalities have petitioned the province to help us or do something. Are we, are we advocating or, or working to speak to the province about doing something for the cost of our outrageous insurance? Um, I believe that we have submitted, um, 
have submitted uh, in the past to the province. I, I'm trying to think, it might have been two years ago, maybe. I don't, so I don't remember the exact date. Um, and that was on the joint in several. There is a lot of organizations um, such as AMO, LAS, um, that all work at, at advocating for that to, to look at municipal insurance. But the province so far has not been responsive on that. I know, thanks. Any other questions or comments on that? Okay, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. So now moving on to Julia's 74th report. It is um, 9.3.12 report number Corp 2023-22 investment policy statement repeal and replace. We do have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Armour, seconded by Councillor Stone. It is recommended that the investment policy statement attached as appendix one to corporate to report Corp 2023-22 be approved and further that resolution number GC4-22 be rescinded. Director McKenzie. Sorry. Thank you. So back in 2020, um, we actually moved to um, prudent investment um, for most of our investments. Um, so each year we're required under that, um, under the act to revise our, um, our uh, investment policy statement, um, which we're doing today. Um, the investment board takes the revised policy and then they'll update our, um, our plan for the year. So that's kind of the whole process. And then we'll come up with a plan for the, the following year. Um, with regards to what's happened in the past, I do have a report coming back next month, which will um, provide an overview of our investments and how they performed um, over 2022, just if you're wondering. Okay. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, with that, I'll ask the question. All in favor? It's carried. All right, and this is your last report. Um, 9.3.13 uh, regarding report Corp 2023-23 refund policy. We have a motion moved by Councillor Schumacher, seconded by Councillor Renwick. It is recommended that committee approve the fees refund policy as attached to report Corp 2023-23. Director McKenzie. Um, thank you. So this policy um, should be required or is required um, that we have if because we accept online payments. Um, so this isn't a change to any of the current practices that we already have in place. It's just that we're formally documenting them and then we're going to post them on our website as a policy. Any questions or comments on that? I'll call the question. All in favor? And with that, thank you, Director McKenzie. We had to read all these reports, but you had to write them. So thank you for all that. Okay, now we are moving on to Lisa Smith, um, 9.3.14, report number HR 2023-5, Human Resources Strategic Plan 2022-2026, to progress report for information only. The report submitted for information. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Director Smith. Any questions on Director Smith's report? Okay, seeing none, I believe you can go back. <laughs> All right, thank you, Director Smith. All right, we are now going to um, Claire Kalea on 9.3.15, report Corp 2023-24, Huntsville Public Library, IT Service Agreement. We have a motion moved by Councillor Cloutier, seconded by Mayor Alcock. It is recommended that committee approves the HPL and IT managed services agreement attached as Schedule A to report Corp 2023-24, and further that the Chief Administrative Officer and the Manager of Information Technology be authorized to sign the one-year agreement for the period of January 1st to December 2023. And further that the Chief Administrative Officer and the Manager of Information Technology be authorized to sign the yearly amendment to the IT Services Agreement required to update budget parameters. With that, I'll hand it off to Claire Clea. Thank you, Chair Morrison. Um, this uh, agreement is actually a piece of the current Huntsville Library uh, MOU that's already in place. 
Um, it just gives a little more uh, bit of information regarding the IT services. Great. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? It's carried. Okay, and sticking with our clerk, we are moving on to 9.3.16, Report Corp 2023-26, Amendment to Procedural Bylaw 2019-45 as amended. We have a motion moved by Councillor Stone, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald. It is recommended that committee approve the draft bylaw amendment to procedural bylaw 2019-45 as amended, attached as Schedule A to report Corp 2023-26. And further that, the draft bylaw be forwarded to Council for consideration. Okay. Thank you, Chair Morrison. This is um, just some may minor housekeeping items that we'd like to change in the procedure of bylaw. There are a few that I uh, have outlined in the report that are a little more significant. One is um, staff can now attend uh, the meetings hybridly before they were unable to. Um, I think this was put in place just because Council of the Day thought they didn't want, uh, if they were on holiday, they didn't want to encourage them to be Zooming in. Um, but staff really would like the ability to do so. And also if they were at, uh, if Director Kiwi was at Public Works and wanted to uh, zoom in on his report and show you something specific, he wouldn't be able to. So this is just a, a, a tool to use for that. Uh, and I'm sure the CAO will encourage the staff not to attend if they're uh, on holiday. So she'll take care of that. Um, the other thing is uh, the removal of the three readings of the bylaws. I know everybody is picked up on that little thing. Uh, I can't remember what meeting at, but. <laughs> so I, I'm going to remove that. Um, the other thing is during, um, because of the change from planning committee last term to planning council this term, uh, public hearings is now of course removed. However, the director uh, Maxwell wanted to make sure the agent or applicant had an opportunity to speak even though uh, it wasn't a public hearing. Um, so she requested that this be placed in. Um, the last one that's more significant is the speaking limits on the three new committees. I know that um, even though they are full committees of council, I know that uh, a little more dialogue is required and uh, so speaking limits will, at, will be uh, to the chair to decide. Any questions or comments on that? Oh, okay, I'll call the question, all in favor? Okay, that's carried. Your stuff is way quicker than Director McKenzie's, I'm just saying. <laughs> And now we have 9.3.17 report number Corp 2023-27 post-election report on the 2022 municipal election and this is for information only. Thank you, Chair Morrison. So as required, um, I'm required to come back with a report after the election and this is it before you. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, moving right along. Okay, 9.3.18 report number Corp 2023-29 Town Owned Land Working Group Establishment. I have a motion moved by C Deputy Mayor Armour, seconded by Councillor Schumacher. It is recommended that committee establishes a Town Owned Lands Working Group consisting of the following members. Councillor Scott Morrison, Councillor Bob Stone, Legal and Agreements Coordinator, Manager of Corporate Information, Administrative Support, Manager of Parks and Cemeteries, Manager of Taxation and Revenue, and Planner. And further that, the mandate of the working group shall be to categorize all town-owned lands and to determine the surplus land to be developed and or sold. And further that, the town-owned lands working group will continue until completion of their review and a final list of town-owned lands for potential sale be provided to committee. Any questions or comments? Well, I guess you're gonna start with some comments, yes. Thank you, Chair Morrison. So this um, was actually in place, uh, I believe the CAO 211, 213 back then. Um, it first, a group was in existence then and they looked at all the town owned lands and they did some significant work back then. Then they rolled out some phases to, sale, uh, to sell the town owned land. Um, there was two phases done and some of them uh, were sold. We do have a bylaw that has all the list of what is remaining, but of course since that was 213, 
10 years ago. Now we want to look at it again. The other piece is the manager of corporate information. She has designated um, pieces as uh, just on her own knowledge using different uh, documents that we have, but really wants the expertise and advice of, of the group to maybe it's not you know, correctly designated. So uh, this group is going to look at all that. It is not to find attainable housing. Um, I know if we happen to stumble across that as we go, um, that would be wonderful. But we know that these are kind of off pieces, stuff like that. It's not really um, for that. So I just wanted to clarify if that's what you're thinking. Any comments or question on that? Okay, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? <laughs> and that's carried. And because our clerk is amazing, I know what I'm supposed to do next, which is pass this thankfully on to Deputy Mayor Armour uh, to take over as chair. Uh, thanks, Councillor Morrison. Now, uh, this is where you get all the DC charges, right? So, anyhow, we have a um, development services at 9.4.1, Richard Clark. He's doing a report, uh, DV 2023-47. That's the 2022 planning application overview. And this is for information only. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, through you, Chair Armour. Um, I, the planning department takes forward a report every year to document uh, planning application activity um, in each year prior, and this is that report. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Do we have any questions? I see none. Thanks, Richard. Uh, we're going to move on to 9.4.2. Uh, Chris Nagy's here. He's got a report, DEV 2023 Compliance Letter Procedure Review with Stakeholders Proposal. And I do have a motion for this. So it's moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Clark. It's recommended that staff be directed to hold an open house to discuss the draft proposed compliance report property information process policy process. And further that, staff be directed to finalize the policy, incorporating feedback, and bring it back to committee for consideration. It's all yours. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor Armour. Um, so yeah, we're real excited to uh, bring this report in front of uh, committee today. Um, through uh, some couple quick notes with respect to the report. So uh, through our current process, we find that staff deal with several calls uh, pertaining to information listed within the current compliance reports um, and staff feel that this um, can be more, uh, there can be some more efficiencies. Therefore, staff are looking to engage realtors as well as real estate lawyers in the public, in a public open house uh, to discuss ways to better the process so that municipal information can be provided at the time of listing as opposed to the time of sale. Um, this information will include property allowances including uh, STR information, septic information, our discretionary septic reinspection information, um, building permit status and accessory structures allowances. Uh, to ensure that this information is not stale dated through this process, um, uh, at the request of the buyer's lawyer, staff will prepare a further review um, with the previous report and update the information as required. It should also be noted that in the past, staff had had similar engagements with this industry and through this public forum, staff were able to adopt um, successful um, allowances within the, within the report. Uh, upon completion of these open houses, staff will bring back a final policy for council's consideration with the attached final procedure. So with that, I'll leave it for questions. Excellent, thanks Chris. Uh, we have any questions? Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair Armour. Um, thanks for the report. I found it very interesting. Uh, many of you know I've been in the business of real estate for 24 years and Councillor Morrison as well. So um, I, I decided to reach out to some of my colleagues to get some of the uh, their opinions on some of the changes that we're talking about. So based on those conversations, um, a few comments that came up were, was that initially the proposal may actually increase your workload um, for staff as homeowners and realtors are not likely going to understand all the information on the compliance letter. Um, 
so usually a lawyer would review a lot of the items that you're going to find on that. Um, another thing that came up was that real estate lawyers may have a, few, a, a, a couple issues. One, um, they may require a current compliance letter uh, to close a transaction. So when we list a home, uh, we go through the process, list it. Um, it could be, you know, then it goes to market, then it sells. It could be three, four, right now it could be five months between the time you list a home uh, and by the time it sells. So one of the concerns that, um, that was brought up was that the lawyer may ask for a, a current letter. And title insurance is one of the things that is purchased usually a week or two before closing on a property. So the lawyer may say, well, you know, a five month compliance letter isn't really all that current. Uh, and they may, they may wanna see something more current. Um, Overall, though, I think, it's a, I think it's a good report and I think it's a good idea. Um, I think it could eliminate a lot of last minute issues that come up when a deal closes. And, um, but I think the key to the whole thing is gonna be involving realtors and involving uh, real estate lawyers in the open house process. That's gonna be where most of your comments come back, um, good and bad, and, and what are the good ideas to move it forward. Thanks, Councillor Clark. Um, I, I go can ahead, Chris. respond. Yeah, so um, just to kind of give you some scenarios, in the open houses, we are looking to have visuals and um, kind of show, show the current process and where we're seeing some issues. Uh, like you've pointed out, you know, in that 11th hour, if there's open building permits on site, we're getting kind of that slack of, well, you know, it's sold previously and what does that look like? And, you know, my, my deal's not going to work and everything. So that's, that's kind of seeing that as an issue as well as this discretionary septic um, allowance under our property standards to get that kind of day one um, when that property is listed it gives us a lot of time you know if if we are looking at the five months i know last year it seemed like it was three days and they were off the market but <laughs> but you know it's kind of getting that what's going on with this property right up front and then to reiterate we are looking at um, looking at our costing and also, hey, if we've already done the brunt of the work as far as creating that report for the, um, for the agent, when we get those requests from the lawyers to have a reduced fee and just update, ideally, you know, A, they've done the discretionary inspection re uh, review, and then B, any open permits have been closed, so then the lawyers are getting that at a quicker uh, turnaround rate as well, right? So, yeah. Good follow-up, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. So uh, just a couple of questions. Yep. How much will the fee uh, be to get the compliance letter? And what are we gonna, how are we gonna regulate it? How, who gets it? Like, who, is it the realtor or is it the, uh, the homeowner? How are we gonna regulate that? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so, so through you. Um, right now, our current fee schedule for compliance reports are uh, $130. Um, we haven't finalized those things because we really want to talk to the industry and get a get a sense of you know what will work for them and what can work for us and, and things like that. I think you hit the nail on the head that it is going to be a real education piece when we have these open houses on why are we doing it as a municipality and everything. Um, I would like to say that it would between those two reports we would still fall within that budgeted uh, allowance and, and things, but maybe breaking it out so the initial report is a hundred and the secondary report is $30 for the, for the updated aspect, right? So um, r currently right now, if there is a change and we have done the compliance report and let's say we do go out and finalize a building, there's no fee on updating that report if requested by the lawyer. So that's why I say that 130 may still work, so. Go ahead, Councillor Clark. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, and the big thing too is right now, of course, we've got a lot of out of town agents that are coming up to, uh, to, to sell list properties. So what's the plan to deal with out of town realtors that don't know how we're gonna be doing the new process here potentially? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so what we're looking at is we're actually going to invite the, um, the realtor board in the area and um, you know, invite local realtors through that aspect. Ideally, if there is somebody, I, 
my understanding is is that out of town agents may still be registered with that particular board to see what's going on and things like that so we're going to try and use that as a sounding panel of of the open houses and everything but really at the end of the day i think we need to have the uh, idea if we go through with this program and we're issuing all of these official reports to uh to these realtors if staff are getting in future the questions on what's the zoning of the property, what, what are the uses, everything, and we've done that report, it should be go talk to the listing agent or get that information some, some, uh, some other way, right? It'll also kind of be allow for that ability that if it is an out-of-town out agent, the ability to educate them on our process and why am I getting all these calls from local realtors, right? So it'll be an ongoing, I think, education piece, but really it starts with these open houses to to see what the uh, what's going on. So yeah. Thanks, Mike, Chris. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Elcock. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Armour. I, I, Chris, you keep saying the open houses. The recommendation makes reference to staff be directed to hold an open house sure. to discuss the draft. So I, I, it was sort of following on the lines of how if if it's one in person open house or a virtual. Um, open house or many or maybe I misunderstood no thank you very much for that mayor Alcock um, in the report I believe we suggested having two open houses um, and if the if the recommendation does not uh, speak to that um, if we want to have clarity on that then that's fine um, the thoughts were is to not uh, not essentially segregate the realtors like anybody can come to them but if you know there was more um, the real estate agents want to have a certain conversation as opposed to the um, real estate lawyers we were gonna kind of separate it out in that realm so yeah. oh, okay I think the, yeah. and I'm not is that how you read it the recommendation I'm reading in the note says directed to hold an open house yeah. To discuss, so that is I that is correct. It says an open house. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think your intention is it's more than one open yeah, house, exactly, and yep. maybe yep. a yep. couple of different types of open houses. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, so I think. So. Okay. Madam Clark, Thank does you. need an amendment for that? You have a mover. I I'll move. So move. <laughs> and seconded by Councillor Fite. Are really there any like more questions? Oh. Councillor Morrison. Just quickly to follow up on what Councillor Clark was touching on, as far as <clears throat> when we list properties as realtors, when you list a property, you, you tend to try to offer as much service as you can. And I believe being able to come into the town and get some stuff on your client's behalf is, is a big add-on. Uh, and I think it also could be a benefit to the town because you could have the usual suspects coming in, like the, the realtors that you know, as opposed to 300 property owners coming in. So is it possible that with a signed document, you could have authority to come in on your client's behalf to get the compliance paperwork? Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, so actually the bylaw directly speaks to that. Um, that's, uh, that's being proposed. So uh, within there, it's, it's noting uh, the property owner can always come in and then through authorization, the agent as well as um, any um, uh, real estate lawyer on behalf of either a purchaser, a lender, or um, uh, a uh, owner for whatever reason. So, yeah. As a follow-up follow up to that, um, would the realtor be able to initiate a compliance uh, visit or is it just they'd be able to pick up the letter? So, um, as soon as we have that authorization, in the past we have allowed, let's say there's an outstanding uh, building permit, we have worked with um, realtors that maybe their client are uh, aren't local to actually arrange those inspections and everything. So we take it as soon as they have authorization that they can uh, comment on uh, building permits associated with the with the property. So excellent. Do we have any more questions? Um, but we do have an amendment. So moved by um, Mayor Alcock and seconded by Councillor Clark, it's recommended that staff be directed to hold two open houses to discuss the draft proposed compliance report, property information policy, and furthermore that staff be directed to fi finalize the policy, incorporating feedback, and bring it back to the committee for consideration. I call the question, all in favor of that? That carries. And all in favor of the original? Maine, Maine is 
as amended. And that carries. Thanks. So we're going to move on to 9.4.3. It's report number DEV 2023 46, Town of Huntsville owned lands, housing potential. And Kirsten Maxwell, Director Maxwell, here for us. Floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Armour. Um, the report's pretty straightforward. I reviewed all of the properties that I could find, narrowed them down, whittled them down based on existing use and whether or not they were deeded as parkland. And uh, there's the two blocks remaining, the two different sides of Florence Street blocks. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And we have a question, Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Chair Armour, and thanks for the report. Um, so in essence, what you're saying, after all of the review of all of the possible properties, that it, in your opinion, we really only have two properties that you think are, are worthy. Uh, through you, uh, Chair Armory, ultimately, yes. The, um, just based on a desktop review and not physically visiting all the other sites. Right. The properties that were deeded as parkland, for example, that are passive parkland and not being used, yeah. could we use some of them for housing? Potentially, but that would be a discussion council would have to right. determine if, you, if they want to. If you There's want to enter into that. Exactly. Right. There's um, opportunities like Irene Street, the, the parkland piece that's there. There's a developed playground structure, but it's actually three lots, three town lots. So it's, it's an interesting setup because there's the parkland structure on one piece and then there's a swing on another piece. So if we were looking at consolidating the parkland as it's developed and things like that, there, there is potentially more opportunity, but I also um, don't know if it's appropriate to look at all these other options if we're not doing multiple residential. There's, there's maybe more opportunity for single family in the rural area as well, but. And that, this that goes to the heart of the second question, so which is, there may be opportunities that are different types of properties that perhaps the council could consider selling those and putting those funds Back into, into right, okay. And this report doesn't really, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Renwick. Thank you, Chair. Um, to you, uh, Kirsten, so there are two properties here, but it looks like there's three. Is that just the, the, the one that's to the, I guess the north of Florence Street West? It looks like the one is very oddly shaped, and then there's that long, skinny one. Are they separate? That it's unfortunately, it's my bad map. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's one. There was a much nicer map attached to uh, the previous report about the telecom tower that had all of the parcels. It's actually 12 or 13 parcels on that piece on that. that are all separate, but I lumped them together to make one block. And just a follow-up with oh, that. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so when we were talking this morning about the towers, the piece of property that you were talking about, I think um, uh, Chair Armour was the one that's on the other side of Florence Street, is it not? That's the piece that we're talking about right there? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Councillor Fitzgerald. Oh, thank you, Chair. Deputy Mayor Armour. Um, I think it's great that we're going through this process again. I think we should have the opportunity to look at the properties that have been discounted off of this list um, for affordable housing, um, there's still opportunity that presents itself, maybe not for the town to donate or to partner with someone who is interested in, in our affordable housing initiative. Um, and I, I hope that we can move forward and, and look at some of the parkland and look at some of these smaller sites. We, we know that we're not we're not reaching our goals for housing, so we have to think out of the box. And are we going to allow some homes on smaller lots? Are we going to allow multi-units on smaller lots, or or look at some different zoning potential? Um, so I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of these and we keep them on the back burner, and that we're maybe next time we go through this process, we can look at them and we can decide as a council of whole is do we think any of these have greater potential than than this report lends itself to so but a, a great report and i'm looking forward to seeing all the properties and everything you're going to create with them thank you 
Thank you, um, Dr. Clusey. Did you have a question? No, I was just just uh, the question. Oh. Yeah, the, uh, oh. Chair Arvind, thank you. Um, I was going to say that the majority of the properties are available on our external mapping on the Tom, and and you can add the layer that talks about town-owned parcels, and then it's differentiated between ones that are developed and ones that are vacant, ones that have been declared surplus. So, so there is opportunity to look at them all, just not as a group at this point. So. That's excellent. Councillor Morrison. Just really a comment, uh, Chair Armour, as an aside, we discovered just yesterday that there's a plan of subdivision that was approved on that land in 1910 <laughs> for nine lots. So it has, at one point, 100 years ago, it was designated for development already. So. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? I don't see any. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. I'll turn the chair over to Mayor Elcock. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we are now under new business, and our first item is the 10.1 uh, Huntsville Community Living Algonquin Theater, the waiving of fees. This goes back to the presentation from this morning uh, from Community Living from Jennifer Jarrett. So um, I guess what I'd be asking council at this point, we've had the request, um, is there an appetite to put a motion on the floor? And I am seeing Councillor Fitzgerald followed by Deputy Mayor Armour. I think Deputy Armour had his finger Did up he? first. So Did he? I don't I'm have my gonna, glasses I'm on. I'm gonna let him have that. My glasses on. Okay. So I think we're thinking the same, he and I, so, but you go ahead. Okay, okay. all right, perfect. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Carol Cock, I'm not really sure we're thinking the same thing, but anyway, I was thinking of um, giving a, uh, basically a 50% discount to them right now, and we use those funds from our MAT. So um, we take it out of our MAT fund to cover the costs, so there's no loss of revenue, and um, we give them a report. So that's a proposed, so you'd like to put, you'd like to put that like motion to on, that the on the floor? I'd like to propose that on the floor, yeah. All right, and Councillor Fitzgerald, is that? I was, I was going to be a little more generous, I think. I, I think they're really struggling right now with, with funding and uh, with food costs and, and with rental costs um, and with shortages of housing. So um, I, I don't see that as a, um, an ask after the fact as something that we should perhaps penalize them for. Would we be more likely to give it to them if they asked ahead of time, they weren't aware. And there's someone who is aware of almost everything that's available out there and works hard every day to make it happen. So um, it's such a small amount, but it means so much to 300 families in our community. And the offset, I think, I, I can't imagine one of my constituents saying we shouldn't do that. So I guess I'll, I'll put this back. So we have two separate motions. Um, would someone second your motion, Councillor Fitzgerald, or uh, Deputy Mayor Armour? Definitely, I would support um, Councillor Fitzgerald's motion. Okay, so we have a mover and a seconder. And uh, Councillor um, Cluche. So uh, what you're proposing, through you, Chair, uh, so what you're proposing is we cover the whole amount through MATA. Is, is that what you're proposing? Yeah, okay, no, I'm behind that 100%. Okay, so um, thank you for that before. All right, um, I, Tanya, you just went like this. Is that because the, our Director McKenzie, is this a point where you'd like to jump in? Um, I'm not sure. Um, so it wouldn't be through HADMATA because that would actually, they would actually have to go to the HADMATA and, and make, Re that make that request. request. Right, we can't do that on their behalf. We can't do that on their behalf, and if and just remember, if they do go to Hadmata, they can't come back to this right. the town for a request. For, so I'm not sure if they would be better to go to Hadmata. So the, so the other thing I just wanted to mention, just quickly, is just we have the policy that um, so we'd have to make sure that it falls within our policy for the use of our MAT funds. Okay, so I'm I'm going to ask um, the RCAO to speak to that. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it, it would in fact be, uh, the recommendation we have crafted up actually states that it would come from the town of Huntsville's portion of the municipal accommodation tax. 
So as per Director Maxwell, it does fit in the current policy under supporting community initiatives. So what I'm hearing is the full amount to be funded from the Town of Huntsville portion of the MAP money, and it does qualify under the program. I, our, our clerk has prepared something, not quite, she says. Um, but I think, why don't, why don't we put it on the screen and then we can have a discussion around what we have on the screen. All right, and it's draft, it's, it's not quite, but it's something. Correct, Mayor Alcock, we can, we can craft it as we're going. Um, just an important note, if, if, the amend, if everybody's happy with the amendment, but somebody's not happy with the amount, you would ask for the motion to be amended. So once we carry the motion, whatever it is, you don't change the amount then if you didn't approve it, because you'd have to reconsider it again. So just a, a procedural we, little note. But we may not put the amount in and vote on it before we, I mean, so we can still put it up there and discuss it. Though. Right, but if yeah. they decided to, if, if um, the mover and seconder decided to put an amount in and somebody wasn't in favor, they would ask for an amendment on it. And that, okay, all right, that's, that's interesting because right now you don't have an amount in there. So right. we'll wait and, and see. Maybe we'll have the discussion before the mover and seconder put an amount in there. Right, and um, y I would just need the amount confirmed um, from um, Director Babineau. As to what the total amount is? Okay. I have 3,547 and 63 cents, but that was our sentence. Yeah. What, what, sorry? 3,000. $547.63. Okay, um, you don't have to put that in yet though because then we won't be, okay, perfect. It's going up on the screen. Okay, and I'll read this and then we'll have the discussion. Okay, we have a motion uh, moved by um, Deputy Mayor Armour, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald, it is recommended that committee support in principle the Community Living um, 2023 Huntsville's Got Talent event and further that applicable rental fees as per the fees and charges bylaw in the amount of, oh, so you've got an amount in there, 3,547.63 be waived. Um, and further that, the remaining fees in the amount of X be funded from the Town of Huntsville's portion of the Huntsville Municipal Accommodation Tourism Tax, and further that staff be directed to consider addressing reductions in fees to the, su to support, to the support organization that support transitional youth and vulnerable adults and other charitable organizations in future updates of the town's user fees and charges bylaw. I love the last paragraph. I think that last paragraph is great. Okay, with that, I, um, I will ask the mover and seconder if, if first, if this is what is, uh, th does this meet your, okay, nod. All right, I will open it to the rest of the floor. I think Councillor Renwick. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I would be in agreement to have half of that amount be waived as opposed to the full amount. And I just want to state that I am in 100% agreement with the works that Community Living does. I, you know, I support them. I've been on their board. I, I gave freely of my time, so I don't want it to think that I'm not supporting. Um, this was an event that they, they knew that they were going to be charged this amount. They signed a contract. And I understand like, if they'd come before us ahead of time, possibly we would have changed it, but I, it's the cost of doing business. And I, I, I don't want to be cruel, but I just think they knew this is what, this is what the cost was going to be. Okay, so. thank you. And uh, Councillor Stone. Thank you. I just want to re reiterate uh, some of what I said earlier. So um, they created this fundraiser and they were hugely successful, $17,000, that's gigantic. So I, I, I commend them for that. Um, our our theatre is underfunded already. So the taxpayers are ha helping to keep that going. And now we are going to need to use taxpayer money to spend another $3,500. So it's not just they can use the park and we don't make any money. This is something that's underfunded. And I, I really worry that um, this is a lot of money. It, it's, it's not a couple hundred bucks. Um, so I would 
not be in favor of doing the full amount. Um, and I'm reluctant for the half, but I could get my head around that. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Morrison, did you have your hand up or no? I, I, you don't have to. I yeah, just, I, I would speak I, to, I guess I need to speak specifically to the motion, but it ties into more of our, our MAT funds. Um, I'm very willing to support um, forgiving some fees if it's coming out of the MAT fund. I wanna make sure the theater is made whole because the theater is, like you said, grossly underfunded. I, I'm not as worried about the amount. I mean, the if we're if we're basically giving thirty five hundred dollars to community living and that lets them do more, I, I, I like that. I just don't want it to affect the operations of the theater. And maybe this is a, a great catalyst for us to have a conversation with Director McKenzie and have a real good policy going forward. Because what I don't, I don't want to see happen is somebody runs a fundraiser and they do really well with it, and then they find out, they look through the minutes of our meetings and say, you know what, we can go back, even though we made 25 grand, we can make another three grand if we just go to council and ask for that money back. So, so that's the only thing I'm hesitant on, but I, I want as much money as possible to go to community living because it fits into all the stuff I care about, you know, and, and housing, community wellness, mental health, addictions. So I don't want to be a hypocrite. I, I think I would support the number, but I think we need to make sure this doesn't set a precedent and then we work together on a solid proposal for how we deal with this going forward and just make sure it's consistent. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Cluche. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, if we're taking it out of the MAT funds, are we not moving the money from there into the theater funds? Into the theater? So the theater is not losing. So if we're taking it out of the MAT and put it in the funds of the theater, the theater is not losing, right? So it's not affecting the cost of the theater. The theater is still getting their $3,500. That's switch, it's a wash, but I mean, it's the theater, our theater is still getting the cost covered. And we're not out of them, we're just taking money out of our MAT funds. Um, okay, I'm Councillor Clark, followed by Councillor Schumacher. Thank you, Mayor Alcock. Yeah, I 100% I agree with uh, Councillor Cluche. I, I mean, we're, it's going to be paid out of the MAT funds, so if, in my mind, it's not really affecting the taxpayer. It's coming out of the MAT funds, which is then going to go right back in to fund um, the theatre, so they're not going to lose any funds. I do agree, though, with Councillor Morrison. Uh, with his comments that we need to for sure look at a policy going forward so that we have um, a guideline to go by for future things. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you for your... Yeah, I'm totally in agreement with this. I'm okay with the, the tourists paying it over the taxpayer kind of thing is what we're, we're kind of looking at. I would be, and I guess that's where I kind of got a little confused with Greg here around the bylaw policy piece is that I think some of that needs to be cleaned up around people knowing what they can ask for possibly beforehand. I mentioned the community grants and I know Jennifer said they ask for any sort of grant, but I meant our small community grant that we have within the town. There's an ability to apply for that. In this case, I don't think they qualify because they're funded by the province. Although, as she did specifically say, do we take into consideration a program that isn't funded by? They run this program outside and that piece is not funded by the province. So the transitional aged youth program that they do, and knowing from when I did work there, it is one that they fully try to fundraise for and it isn't a program that is covered by the province. So it does kind of speak to that last and further that piece because maybe we do need to look outside of the box when it comes to understanding. But I think that's, again, our policy hopefully will clean up the what is the ask beforehand, what is the small community grant opportunities, what is the HMATA asks that people can go through as a process before they come. So if I may follow up with you, Councillor Schumacher, you're actually expanding that last paragraph because the last paragraph which I really liked was the, let's look at our fees and charges bylaw to, to look at a whole other category that this probably would have fallen under. And so that is, and I think that makes a whole lot of sense. It will capture community living and others, right? Um, but what you're also saying is, let's also look at our other grant programs or other policies 
and um, make sure that they're well known. So that's like a, a am I understanding that correctly? That yeah, I don't know if the education is really out in our community as to what are the options. As Jennifer said, she didn't know she could come beforehand, right? What is the education we're doing with our public and our communities to know that there are various opportunities that they can knock on a door, so to speak, and go through. Okay, so it, maybe it's a, a part B to that third paragraph, which is once we have the discussion about this other category of our fees and charges bylaw, that if we agree as a council that there is another category, then what are we then doing with our community to let them know that we have this uh, other category or whatever we call it? Does that work, do you think? Sure, a and again, I don't know if it needs to be in there or just at least staff know that that's kind of the direction we wanna go with the education piece and, cause sure. I do believe, Bab and note, they are working on some of that stuff. So uh, I was kind of already aware, I just wanna make sure that it's. Okay, the CEO says, no, it doesn't need to be in there. So it was me, I was just trying to clarify. But that's good, that, you know, we're all clear then. All right, so, um, yes, Madam Clerk, what, what, where are we at? Okay, so I'll put it back up on the screen. So depending on um, the amount will depend on the paragraph we put in here. So if I can put it up, we'll start with that. Please, that would be great. I don't, do I don't need to read it again, do I? Uh, no, Mayor Alcock. So your paragraph two is um, Councillor Fitzgerald and Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Armour. And the third one is Councillor Morrison and Councillor Renwick. So if first on the floor was Councillor Fitzgerald and Deputy Mayor Armour, if you're fine with that minus that, um, the mayor can call that vote. Um, or the mayor can ask for uh, questions on that and then we can put the uh, Councillor Renwick and Councillor Morrison an amendment with this paragraph instead. Is that, does that help? So you're, su sorry, you're suggesting I call the vote minus the third paragraph and so if the vote goes in favor of the full amount then we won't go to an amendment but if it's, um, if, if it, doesn't pass, then we immediately can go to the amendment, which is um, at the third paragraph. So uh, I uh, thought my that apologies that's for revisiting. confusing. Yeah, that's revisiting. So paragraph something. one, two, and and four is the first, and and you ask for questions, and then Councillor Renwick and Councillor Morrison have said they would like to amend okay, this gotcha. with this, if I have that correct. Okay, so I did read the original one, two, and four. So I'm asking questions on one, two, and four at this point. Correct. Correct. Good, the CAO says it's correct, so there. All right, questions with respect to one, two, and four of the proposed motion. Councillor Morrison. Yeah, so I didn't specifically say which one I was supporting necessarily. I just supported the money coming out of the MAP tax. So I would, I personally will support the, the full amount um, have it come out of the MAT tax. I definitely share Councillor Renwick's thoughts. Um, you know, that, that this event was highly successful. They did sign a contract. So I want, uh, I don't know how we need to proceed, but perhaps with Director McKenzie, we, maybe we outline that if, um, if you come after the fact, like you need to come ahead of time, or you go to, mm -hmm. maybe we have um, a group that decides if our MAT tax goes out for certain things. And I think they, if they came to strictly a group talking about the MAT tax, we would probably jump up and down to give them the money, right? Because it fits into everything we want to do. It's just that they came to council for it. So I support the whole amount, and I think we should speak to that one or vote on that one. Okay, and so you have talked to them. Speak. You yeah. have, so that's good. Yeah. All right, Deputy Mayor Armour. Uh, just uh, sorry, uh, thank you, and um, just to echo um, Councillor Morrison's comments on this. This is MAT tax. It's not coming from the taxpayer, and this is exactly what that account is for. I understand the fact they came late after it, but it was an unknown. And I'm sure going ahead, we're, pro we're probably gonna end up with a few more people sitting at our table asking for fees to be waived. But this is exactly what this account is for. And I think we all voted at that one time here on this table and that's what we're gonna use the money for. So I, I support 100%. 
Okay, and Councillor Schumacher. Which just echoes to my point, can we at the door, when they come to the theater or something, let them know if there is an opportunity or what that process is? But you guys are working on it. Which I think they're following yeah. up on, Councillor Schumacher. I think that point, very good point, and it is being followed up on, so good point. Councillor Renwick. Thank you, Your Worship. And, and again, maybe to be devil's advocate, but what's stopping the Huntsville Festival of the Arts from going to the mat tax to ask for the, the rental fee for Beauty and the Beast at this time? And there really isn't anything stopping them to do that. So I will withdraw. I guess the motion's not on the table. The amendment's not on the table at this moment. So I will support the, um, the full amount out of the mat tax at this time. So, okay. Um, and just in response to the, the Festival of the Arts, that one might, as a rebuttal to that, say, because the Festival of the Arts is not doing the same work, they're not necessarily, they're doing incredible work. Uh, no, 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 no. Unbelievably important organization in our community. But the, Dan didn't come forward talking about the work that they're doing to provide affordable housing or all of the support services towards the clients that, that community living is currently doing. So that might be a, an important distinction between the two, but not denying at all that they might come forward. Absolutely. Uh, Councillor Morrison. And I guess the one thing I'd like to propose is just a change in wording. I'd love to see this say um, fees reimbursed through our MAT tax as opposed to fees waived. Waiving a fee sounds like we're just saying you don't have to pay for the theater. So if we could change that wording to show, no, no, we're not waiving anything, we're just paying for it out of something else. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Okay. Really like that. Cool. If that's okay, Claire, Kalea. The funding, okay, but nevertheless, I think Councillor Morrison's point is well taken. We're not okay. waiving. Yeah, we're I just, don't want to waive. We're, we're, we're funding it through something else, mm -hmm. right? And I think that is a really important distinction as we move forward, because we made that decision in this case, to your point, Councillor Renwick, about other organizations coming forward. We had a big discussion in this case about this organization to fund it from something else. So we're not waiving it, we're funding it, right? I think that's an important distinction. Thank you for that. So uh, um, where, where do we sit? Is it, um, is waiving? Oh, you did it. You're, that's how quick our clerk is. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh my, oh my God, oh. <laughs> okay, it, is there I, any other discussion around this? I don't see any, I, I will call the question. I, thank you, Count, thank you, Councillor Schumacher. I will call the question, all those in favor, and that carries unanimously. Thank you everybody for that, I'm sure that Jennifer's gonna be quite thrilled. All right, moving right along. We don't have agenda item number 10.2, so going to agenda item 10.3, Huntsville Festival of the Arts projects, waiving of fees, and that one we have a motion already prepared. Can um, you please put that on the screen, Madame? My computer's way faster than Yeah, you're way faster than your computer, I know, I know. And this one hopefully has this over multiple years. That would be good. Council term would be excellent, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, do I have a mover? Uh, yes, Councillor Morrison, seconder, Deputy Mayor Armour. Um, it is recommended that committee support in principle the Huntsville Festival of the Arts Summer 2023 Activity Plan and further that staff be directed to work with the HFA to enter into any agreements required to the satisfaction of the Director of Community Services. Further that committee approves the following Group of Seven Canoe Mural Project in River Mill Park from June 1st to October 1st in 2023, 24, 25 and 26. Piano and Civic Square for the summer season. And further that all applicable fees as per the fees and charges bylaw be waived. Do we want to add the piano and civic square for the summer season up to 20, you know, the term of council, rest of the term of council or whatever? Well, 
while the clerk is doing that. Are there any questions or comments with respect to this motion? Okay, I'm not seeing any. I will call the, I will call the question, <laughs> Councillor Schumacher. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously too. That is fantastic. General information, we don't have any. So, look at this. I have a motion moved by Councillor Fitzgerald, seconded by Councillor Renwick. It is recommended that we do now adjourn at 3.09 p.m. All those in favor?